two panels and two two keynote speakers and today we also have two very interesting panels ahead the one starting right now is about changing societies in the south caucasus and we have the fourth panel about uh, conflict conflict transformation and its prospects in the south caucasus which will be followed by the keynote speech the final keynote speech of the conference by Dr. Lawrence Broers, uh, who will discuss South Caucasus after 2020, new and old dimensions of regional future. So please stay tuned for the, for the entire day of the conference. Um, I would like to remind you that it is live streamed on Facebook. Uh, and it is recorded for, for the archive of CRC's conferences. Uh, if you are willing to ask questions uh, to the presenters, you can post them in chat or you can raise a hand after the uh, presentations are over during the Q&A session and um, you can voice your questions, comments, etc. Thank you very much once again. And now I give floor to Sona Balasanian, who will be moderating this third panel. Uh, dear Sona, please. Thank you, Maida. Hello, everyone. Today we are starting the second day of the seventh CRRC conference. Uh, as Mariam already introduced, I'm Sonam Balasanyan from CRRC Armenia. I will be chairing this panel on the changing societies of the South Caucasus. The South Caucasus has been and still is about changing societies. In this context, it is always very important and useful to have reflections upon major social changes as we see these and as these changes can be imagined for understanding the societies in the South Caucasus and for getting to better know how different and how similar in a sense they are. From urban landscape, civic activism, creative economy to remoteness and disconnection with the societies in, within the societies in the South Caucasus, the presenters will give you an important overview of some aspects of social life in Azerbaijan, Georgia, in the Caucasus and Eastern Black Sea region. Not to take too much of your precious time, I am now giving the floor to Zulfia Mehdieva from CRC Azerbaijan, who will be presenting on the following topic. Is Baku a smart city? Challenges, perspectives, and potential. To remind, starting from 11.15, we will have 15 minutes questions and answers session. Sofia, please, we are looking forward to your presentation. Let's begin. Thank you. So let me share my presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was a research fellow in CRS Azerbaijan. So, and my topic was um, smart cities and uh, the potential and challenges for Baku to become smart city in the future. So I'm excited to present my uh, overview of research paper and I hope it will be interesting. So first of all, I would like to talk about why actually smart city concept is getting uh, popular all around the world and why it's important for Caucasus and for Baku. So uh, nowadays in, uh, in the world, uh, the population of cities is increasing and according to the UN, uh, by 2050, this percentage will be uh, 68%, which means the smart city concept is very um, hot topic, is very much uh, becoming hot topic for many cities and including Caucasus. Uh, but actually, what does it mean? So uh, the purpose of a smart uh, city concept is to analyze and integrate the key information of core systems in grounding cities, which means um, the smart city concept is not about just uh, destroying the whole city and creating the new one, but just integrating the current system uh, and to make it more efficient and uh, useful for people. And uh, to make cities smart, um, historical development, societal culture, and late landscape should be considered. 
Um, according to my literature review, there is no fra uh, fixed framework uh, that can be used uh, for cities to become smart. So, for example, it's impossible to take uh, one smart city concept, let's say, from Japan and implement it in, it, in Caucasus, because every city has its own historical, cultural development. And as you see from the second one, like it's a city, his, uh, its historical and cultural artifact, its social and political network and economy. And according to European Commission, uh, smart city is a place where traditional networks and services are made more efficient with the use of digital and telecommunication technologies. So it's probably very broad to say that, yeah, it's there is no fixed framework. Um, it's uh, very broad. We can't implement one framework for many cities. But how actually to consider um, the city smart? So that's why I just picked uh, some examples and of course my first example is about Singapore because this is the smart, smartest city all around the world um, yeah there is no one fixed framework but there are certain factors uh, if we say that why why Singapore is considered as a smart one so there are certain things like smart mobility solutions Health and safety is integrated to the city uh, system smart nation which is about literacy the internet of things and supporting business by government. And I picked uh, one, another example uh, from Europe, um, London. So here we also see some uh, factors like data store, transportation system, intelligent road network, uh, so also some uh, facilitating people for the development and technology. Yeah, we see that, yeah, they are totally different cities and uh, there are different uh, they have different governing system they have totally different landscape but there are certain factors which are the same for uh, similar for both those um, cities and for many smart cities so although there is no one fixed framework there are certain factors which uh, which makes the all cities smart so this is smart government environment living people smart mobility and smart economy so which means if uh, there are uh, these factors, this city can be considered as a smart one. Uh, my methodology during my research paper was qualitative methods. It uh, had a look from the perspective of Baku and analyzed data. Um, so uh, as I already mentioned, uh, historical development is important uh, for cities to, uh, to be considered. And that's why I also mentioned uh, in my paper about historical development of Baku city. And um, so I will not go deeper to that because of the time, but this is some um, historical development. But just to mention, I didn't mention one historical stage. Um, it's an independence period from 1980 to 1920. It's because um, it's very small uh, um, time and uh, it can it didn't be it didn't considered uh, it wasn't considered by many um, researchers as a stage because of uh, lack of data that period and uh, also it's a very small time to have major change. That's why I also didn't mention it. Uh, so one uh, major challenges for Baku to become smart. First one, I uh, chose hyperbuilding. What does it mean? According to Ai Hua Ong, um, it's a very typical concept for many Asian cities, which means um, the development, the construction of cities uh, happening is not just uh, to attract investments, but also to show the um, this power of state. So this is also typical for Baku. Secondly, structural integrity of new skyscrapers, uh, which means uh, in Caucasus, as you all know, it's uh, it's located in seismically active zone and Baku also. So uh, this is very dangerous um, uh, if, um, for example, any business people uh, to construct huge uh, projects uh, and if they want, for example, to get more in order to get mo more money to use cheaper materials, it's very dangerous for the whole city. Um, next, ecological problems. Of course, this is the main and probably the biggest challenge for Baku because of its industrial development also uh, in the past and now. And uh, the absence of Department of Building and Safety, which means if some there are some construction works and uh, which are which can be dangerous or there is not uh, efficient use of some parts of the city, but another part of the city is used a lot. So there is no one body that regulates that. 
Uh, and as a perspective, I picked certain things. First one is Intelligent Transport Management Center. Uh, what does it mean? Um, so this is a detector uh, which um, um, which identify um, three ma major parameters. The first one is um, the number of cars, speed, and traffic intensity. Uh, and as um, for smart city is uh, one of the first steps to collect data in the city and to use it for uh, for purposes to make cities more efficient. Um, of course, I can, for example, give. Um, some examples from Bangladesh and Kenya, I, which I also mentioned in my paper that, for example, the government collected a lot of data from the city, but it cannot, uh, they couldn't use uh, this data to make uh, cities more efficient. So that's why we can collect data a lot of, we have, might have a lot of data, but it's very important to identify uh, what, uh, how this data will be used and uh, clearly to state which kind of things and which kind of data we need and how to use that. Next, uh, central server via GPS. Then uh, I mentioned one pilot project, Smart City by Cisco, but there are also some other pilot projects. This is also perspective um, for Baku. Uh, benches and light poles, as I already mentioned, uh, smart environment is one of the key factors to be considered as a smart city. So uh, this is um, light poles uh, about efficient use of energy and uh, um, replacing uh, uh, normal lights to the LED lights, which means the energy use will be uh, decreased uh, by 50%. The use of e-government search, especially after pandemic, uh, many people started to use, uh, to get uh, online services um, from governmental bodies instead of going to those uh, offices and uh, to uh, having queues, uh, huge queues there. And Baku White City, it's a huge uh, project um, uh, in uh, Caucasus. Uh, which uh, which is construction uh, project and uh, this is made by UK uh, based uh, uh, famous uh, firm called uh, Atkins um, and uh, as you see from the picture this is a very uh, this has very huge potential to be considered as a smart uh, city. Also, we can't say that Baku White City as a separate, like to measure Baku White City as a separate city because it doesn't have own governing system. It's, it doesn't have own transportation system. It's still part of Baku, but this part of the city has huge potential to be considered um, as a smart one in the future. Uh, then main factors to consider for Baku in the future to become um, uh, smart. First, historical development. So as we already know, um, uh, the smart city concept is not about the, con the reconstructing everything, but to considering histor historical development and uh, uh, in the city and just to adapt current system and to make it more efficient and eco-friendly. And landscape, Baku has very tough landscape because it's mountainous, also it has semi-desert um, climate, and also it's on the seashore. So it affected to the formation of the city in the past, but it's also important nowadays to consider it um, uh, while reconstructing the city. Uh, infrastructure, uh, as we already know, infrastructure is one of the important things uh, uh, to be considered as a smart one. So current system needs to, to be adapted and uh, to modify it, but uh, not uh, to destroy it from the, and start it uh, to construct from the zero. And digital literacy is important. Um, so if, uh, if there is a very advanced um, for example, governing system, let's say e-government, but people still don't know how to use it, it doesn't make any sense. So that's why either the literacy should be developed or some needs should be identified and uh, to be adapted to the people's needs. And that's why this is also one of the factors to be considered. Then uh, I would like to mention my uh, concluding remarks. So first of all, as a human factor is not uh, the main driver of change in Baku. So as you see from the historical development and uh, uh, all, all the happenings, the constructions, uh, human was not the main uh, point uh, and to be considered and to for, for all constructions. There were either economic, business or reputational purposes uh, to the formation of the city. 
then as a challenge, I see the main challenge environmental problem because uh, environment is also important uh, uh, to be considered as a smart city and infrastructure. Uh, because infrastructure is also developed not based on human factor. For example, there are not many benches for uh, not inclusive benches for many people, but uh, there are many roads which also create traffic jam, etc. That's the main challenge. And as a perspective, I picked the government is aware. So we can see that uh, from the conferences, for example, in March, there was a conference in Belarus about smart cities and uh, our government is also participated. And also uh, we can see some uh, pilot projects. This is also a potential that the uh, government is aware about that concept. And uh, the development of e-government literacy, as I mentioned, after COVID, uh, many people started to use uh, such um, uh, services, which is also potential because this is one of the main factors um, uh, for, for smart city concept. So uh, that's all. Um, so um, I am happy to hear questions if you have, and I hope it was interesting. If, if I may. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Did you try, uh, thank you for the presentation. This is really very important for nowadays. I'm interested to know if you uh, made an assessment or you are aware of the cost of making the city smart or, or if there are plans to move towards uh, making the city smart and uh, how much it will cost for the government or businesses or constructors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so for the cost, I can't uh, say honestly because uh, this is this also depends on the um, how how much uh, the government want to invest because you can invest as much as you want and uh, you can make it as smart as possible. But uh, it's uh, in terms of the purpose, uh, smart city concept uh, has main factor. Actually, the formation of cities has one main point to make it uh, comfortable for people and to make it efficient. So smart city concept connects all of this. It, it makes cities eco-friendly. It uh, makes the use of um, everything, every services efficient because of Internet of Things. And uh, it's human friendly concept. So it makes as inclusive as possible uh, to all services for um, city dwellers. So that's why smart city concept is popular uh, in the world and also for, for Baku. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zulfia, for this interesting presentation. I'm sure there will be more questions uh, for the question and uh, question and answer session. Now, uh, let's perhaps move forward to uh, be time framed uh, to the next presentation. Alana Vingilia from Ilia State University uh, will be presenting uh, the topic moral comfort and efficiency of civil activism in contemporary Georgia. Lana, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, just a second, I will make it here. Okay, so you can hear and see me, everything. Okay. Um, uh, um, Moral comfort and efficiency of civil activism in contemporary Georgia is pretty uh, wider topic, but today I will um, uh, focus on the part of it. I think it's very, uh, very important part of it. Uh, the topic of comfort zone and efficiency of civil activism seems to be on the surface all the time you uh, think about your participation and engagement. I have been working in civil society for more than 20 years now. I have experienced this as local NGO manager and a grant seeker, as a, and so as international foundation representative and a grant maker. But most important, I have years of experience uh, working pro bono with different civil activists and non-formal groups as a consultant and a trainer. Uh, why it's important to look at this practice as experience which is ongoing and why it's crucial to share whatever findings um, uh, and conclusions, even negative conclusions you already have. 
Uh, building of democratic state in Georgia started almost uh, 30 years ago. Now it's still a big and challenging process. Uh, uh, but contemporary political theory see civil society and civic participation as its crucial component. Civility, citizenship, and civil activism um, started, started close to, uh, together with the young Georgian state, but even more than the state institution, it had um, to uh, be created from the scratch. Right? Uh, state institution uh, were in the process of modification from the Soviet style to the democratic and in the process of modification uh, it had um, uh, it uh, had some uh, services function uh, civil society and civil participation were starting from the zero uh, past its many uh, stages um, civil society in Georgia now make more important role uh, in state building and democratization than we seen in its 10 years ago perspective. Modernization and conceptual change of communication channels irreversibly modified the public sphere and moved it in online, thus converting many of early basic principles and determinants. Um, uh, Already in 2006, uh, Jeffrey Alexandro, in his book Civil Spheres, he saw the necessity of a new concept of civil society, the civil sphere, where he focuses on solidarity as its main engine of civil activism. This logic draws the line between solidarity with other needs and interests and understanding of public good. One of the ideas which is especially important for us in Alexander's theory comes from the logic that just rational interest and mobilization of resources are not only or main incentive of process, but subjectivity and symbolic communication. Uh, three main feature, feature of post-civil society, uh, post-communist civil society was mentioned by um, uh, Howard all the in 2003, mistrust of formal organization, so-called affiliation uh, to some official group, persistent of friendship networks, and post-communist disappointed with determining of civil sphere for more than a decade after civil society, after Soviet Union collapse. And among NGOs, it was observable in absence of lack of volunteering in the political processes of fear of affiliation. Uh, many of different researches uh, so that online media or and social networks pushed civil activism significantly during the last 10 years, uh, but while exposed us to several political limitations as well. For example, in spite of young generation is more active in social networks, and since, for example, in Georgia, since 2017, goes easily goes out from online activism to real actions, the basic political activities like voting in elections is steadily declining. This is official data of our Central Election Commission uh, says that uh, participation rate in elections progressively goes down. Uh, this is group of 15, uh, 18 and 25, the age group of 18 and 25, uh, goes down from almost 24% in 2012 to almost 18% into 2020 elections. Here we reach our main point um, uh, or hypothesis, which tries to assess the efficiency of civil activism, not from the participation point of view, but from the, I mean, uh, any participation matters since it developed in civil cultures, but from the result oriented uh, of resource and time. Here I see researches from civil participation uh, of, of civil participation on 2011 and 14 gave us a very good baseline, which enables comparison of current situations and identified possible reasons for existing change. Here we should take in mind that research that research um, uh, was only on non-governmental organizations, the formal and understanding of civil initiative and uh, informal uh, growth was insignificant by that, by that moment. 
So um, this here you can see uh, the statistics, which uh, says that have you signed a petition or collected letter during last year, raised from six to twenty-two during that three years. On what extent the person working for NGO is trustworthy and positive answer doubled, even uh, in three years, a number of people answered don't know about about NGOs dropped by whole 20%, which is quite reasonable. The same level of approval could be seen also among uh, people who think that civil protest matters. But here we should also take into consideration that this was a period when internet use and internet accessibility raised drastically uh, in the country. Uh, partially it was caused by state programs, um, uh, where uh, in all public schools, all public space, and even all open public space, there was implemented an internet free internetization program. And uh, so uh, this was a period of boom in formal online initiatives. Here we could remember the Gudiashvili uh, Square case. Maybe it was the first um, uh, first case when. Uh, online activism goes in real life. Maybe Georgian participants remember this story. Uh, despite seeing, but let's back to the main topic of our conversation. And uh, despite seeing more revolutionary movement, we will see less revolutionary outcomes. Fully realized revolution resulting in dramatic and political turnover. So um, this uh, uh, this uh, this is a quote of 2014 book, The New Digital Age by Conan and Schmidt, which seems very interesting in assessment of current situation in uh, uh, today's um, uh, condition. Uh, so now um, uh, for. Uh, First visible case uh, was um, during uh, five six years. We had a lot of uh, last uh, five six years. We had a lot of cases uh, when several major cases when uh, less experienced civil uh, when uh, when demanded protest reached high point, gained wide attention, and seemed to be able to grasp the result, but it didn't. First visible case was Bassiani protest when less experienced civil activists didn't allow any politician to participate in the leading and resulted in wasting of strong spark and solvent of youngsters and got almost nothing in of their demands. Uh, June 20th events followed almost the same path and got partial political results uh, only with involvement of politicians. Unprecedented mobilization and consolidation of different active groups and people never before went out to the street, expected to be followed by political turn, but it didn't have such results by now. So analysis of the processes indicated two main reasons, lack of experience in the processes and absence of the dedication to the results. Uh, 16 uh, in-depth interviews with leaders of uh, civil initiatives and NGOs were conducted for this research. Uh, they represented eight different areas of activism. Sorry, I will move to the next slide. There's environment protection, urban development, human rights, territorial integrity, independence of the judiciary, drug policy, LGBTQ rights, social, political, uh, and cultural heritage prote protection. Um, Democratic data of sampling growth ensured diversity of generation. Here you could see this uh, the, the division in, uh, among age groups and gender as well. Uh, uh, not only age, but years in activism also uh, provided us with wide range of options from 10, 30 years to four months. Um, so what was the reason you stepped in a civil activism? Those are main questions. Um, here you can see uh, the division that um, feeling of justice, it was um, uh, made uh, the key answer, uh, majority, 50% of people answered this way, realizing of own participation importance, uh, is, uh, and no, the, no other choice left. I want to mention that we have another as um, half, open question, uh, half open answer 
other option also for them to answer, but none of them uh, selected this option. Uh, there was no correlation between years in activism and readiness to leave comfort zone uh, for efficiency of their work. 57% uh, of questions confirmed that they had to leave their comfort zone or make uh, something they never done before in attempts to reach their objectives, while 42 didn't. Uh, when we uh, asked, we also were asking why they do they do it. So uh, those who left comfort zone have two major reasons. Goal and the result were more important than their comfort. And understanding the situation needs to be stat. Uh, 28% mentioned this uh, reason. Uh, but for those who didn't leave their comfort zone, a uh, variety of answers were uh, longer. 60% uh, said it was against their personal principles. 20% um, said that their principles and values are more important than any of public interest. And 20% mentioned that others could do it better, so they compromise wouldn't change anything. Um, next, um, so among uh, there was um, the uh, majority. Um, so we were asking um, why, what they see as their achievement. Uh, and why, what they see as their failure during the activism. But uh, interestingly, uh, these uh, uh, replies and answers were almost the same for both groups. Groups, majority named the same important achievements, public awareness raised on particular issue, uh, partial reach of demands and activism appreciation by other people. Major failures were Yes. I'm sorry. Are you close to wrapping up? Because we need yes. to speak to. Yes, I have three slides left. Okay. Yeah. And major were also less similar. Results got only partially, no political result, counterproductive political results. Uh, so, um, I will go a bit forward. Uh, so, the most important thing I would like to mention here is that. Uh, all the positive or um, uh, achievements uh, were, uh, but co uh, co our conversation revealed that main sign of efficiency was uh, case focus and communicate. More people know about the issue, the government enters into dialogue, topic gets, topic gets popularity in media. From democratization and state building point of view, some cases were even counterproductive. Uh, so internet and social networks give us uh, open um, uh, mobilization, solidarity, fundraising issues, and is a uh, very um, uh, useful for marginalized group. But only in 2010, uh, in 2010, Evgeny Morozov, a Belarusian um, uh, a civil activist and a scholar, mentioned that. Uh, in his large book about civil uh, net um, illusion, uh, net delusion that in access to information and uh, ability to consolidate and uh, uh, call for the action is not only it has not only the positive uh, influence on the process. Um, here uh, in 2017, uh, uh, Susan uh, Warsage of uh, studying a post Maidan Ukraine also mentioned um, that among other reasons draw our attention is cost emotional charge. That uh, as long as democratic um, uh, goals of uh, Maidan actually failed, uh, one of the reasons was this emotional charge. Here we see the correlation. New, new communication channels, online public sphere, and user generated content are connected this way. So, the, here I will um, uh, pass uh, this kind of statistics. Uh, so, you see, you could see it. So, here bring some simple figures. Internet use uh, raised from 39, uh, 31 uh, in 2009 to 78 in 2019. Social media uh, use uh, raised in Georgia from 16 in uh, 2011 to uh, 48 in 2019. But democracy the index of Georgia dropped uh, more uh, than a medium rate in, in new 
uh, between 2017 and 2020. So this is a conclusion, um, uh, kind of a small conclusion we can uh, do here. The thing is, the logical assumption could be uh, that in premediated era publicity and acknowledgement were coming after you reach some results of success. When now publicity and social capital and popularities to civil activists comes into process of activism long before major results are achieved. Therefore, moral comfort of activism itself gets more importance. Uh, so, in spite of um, imperfection of formal growth, ability to unite, um, uh, and their incapability to reach policy change, even if unsuccessful, these movements help to popularize civil engagement and make faces of them popular. It also contributes to lessen marginalization of the activism. Thus, all of the online activity, activism finally supports democratization process in the long term. Uh, and uh, it also does not mean that uh, the chain of online protest and mobilization will be dependent on real politicians for a while. Nobody knows how technology and our attitudes and habits to it will change and may change tomorrow and what effect it may have on the politics at all. Near future technology may converse the situation independently for this uh, social shape. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. And we will now be moving forward with yet another interesting uh, presentation to be delivered by Jessica Gosling from University College London, uh, Elena Toidze from Creative Georgia, and Ani Vasharmadze from Business and Technology University. Uh, they will be prepare, presenting on propelled, propelled towards prosperity, the case of the creative economy in Georgia topic. Thank you. The floor is yours. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, what an amazing variety of speakers we've had. So um, we're all very humbled to be here. My name is Jess Gosling. I am a PhD candidate at the University College of London, and I'm joined by Elena and Annie, two of my fabulous colleagues today, who are both from the Creative from, from Creative Georgia and BTU. This is a collaboration between the UK and Georgia, um, and we will be I will be launching um, the soft launch of. Uh, PH, some research that I've been doing for the British Council on digital skills in Georgia. So this is very exciting. So our presentation is about the case for the creative economy in Georgia. Um, there's kind of five main points. We're going to cover the creative economy, current situation in Georgia, the main research, impacts of said research, and some reflections and next steps. As I've said, um, this is who we are. <laughs> I don't need to, any further introduction. Um, so what is the creative economy? In a time of rapid globalization, numerous countries have begun to understand the combination of culture and commerce that the creative industries and the creative economy represent. It's been known as a powerful way to engage abroad and also build up a country's soft power. The creative economy is ultimately a set of practices that include some of the oldest history, as well as some of the things that we've only seen that have emerged in the past 20 years, the result of digital technology to make something new. It is at its core, a set of interconnected activities that turn ideas into cultural services and goods whose values is determined by intellectual property. The, sc the scope of the sector is very broad it encompasses both informal and formal works and spans a variety of industries and remains one of the fastest growing economic sectors in the world. And therefore, it is more important than ever to understand what impact such a sector can have, and as well as the opportunity in the case of Georgia. According to estimates, the current division of labor between humans, computers, and algorithms will generate 133 million new jobs in the next two years. The creative economy contributes to over 3% of global gross domestic product, GDP, 
making it a powerful emerging economic sector, as per UN reports. This is further strengthened by the surge in the digitalization of services. But what is the impact? Within the UK alone, one in eight businesses operate in the creative economy. Digital skills, as well as entrepreneurial skills, are therefore crucial in the digital economy. Both of these are essential for the success of the creative economy, which is disrupting conventional methods of work. Prior to the pandemic, the creative economy contributed over 115.9 billion GVA to the UK economy. That might not seem like much if you look at it on a piece of paper, but that figure is greater than the automotive, aerospace, life sciences and oil and gas, gas industries combined. So in the case of Georgia, obviously the UK is a couple of steps ahead, um, but in reflection to how far we've come, I think the creative economy offers a very unique opportunity for Georgia to propel, propel towards prosperity. And I'm going to hand over to Elena and Annie. Uh, thanks, Jess. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be joining you today. Uh, as Jess mentioned, I'm Elena Toizzi and I'm uh, working at Creative Georgia. I will talk briefly about creative economy in Georgia, uh, taking into consideration the numbers Jess just mentioned. And with this, considering the fact that people in Georgia have always believed that creativity is our main character, that we have rich cultural heritage and we are skilled in different fields of art and culture, we might assume that Georgia too has the potential to transform its diverse cultural and creative resources into something viable and use it as a driving force of the economic development. According to the results of the preliminary study conducted in 2016 using UNESCO Culture for Development Indicators methodology, contribution of cultural and creative activities in GDP of Georgia is 2.8%, and 5.2% 5, 5 of the employed population work in cultural and creative sectors. And these numbers are just underestimates and can show the full picture, as we still do not have the data we need from the National Statistics Office and methodologies and sampling needs lots of refinement. Georgian creative and arts landscape is vibrant and diverse, with dynamically developing fashion design, film and electronic music scenes, successful advertising and architectural agencies. It carries a huge potential within and if nurtured properly, it could boost the entire development processes within the country. So Creative Industries Initiative has been started with adopting the first ever national, uh, uh, national cultural strategy in Georgia, declaring it as one of the main priorities. After strategy development, Creative Georgia, the semi-governmental agency I work at, has been established with a name to support creative ecosystem development. Along with Creative Georgia, different uh, semi-governmental agencies cover some aspects of creative ecosystem development. For instance, Georgia's Innovation and Technology Agency is the main coordinator and mediator in the process of building the innovation ecosystem in the country. Uh, an important structure is National Film Center, supporting film sector development and offering funding schemes for filmmakers. Noteworthy also is the work of Enterprise Georgia, also a my governmental agency that has initiated the Film in Georgia incentive program, offering a 20% cash rebate on qualified expenses incurred in Georgia. Uh, now we can go on current focuses in Georgia. We run different local and international programs at Creative Georgia and mainly focusing on policy development, capacity building, sector mapping, know-how sharing, sector internationalization, etc. Uh, on the slide, you can see the developed during the last three years. And I will just talk shortly about the first one that is being implemented with UNESCO International Fund of Cultural Diversity Support. With this project, first ever baseline research of creative industries has been studied in our country that will give us the possibility to clearly see the challenges within the entire creative industry sector and hopefully for different subsectors as well. This process will be followed by the awareness raising campaign and finalized by creative industry strategy development. Um, I will uh, talk about three main problems. The first one is the low awareness about the creative economy. Georgia is an important field that can contribute to social and economic development, and the awareness of the government agencies not involved in creative or innovative work is still low about its contributions and benefits. This can be said about the representatives of creative ecosystem as well. They do not perceive themselves as part of the industry and do not believe that they can commercialize their services and products. 
And the second important problem is absence of data. Hopefully the baseline mapping process that is currently happening will help us to retrieve important information that could help us implement evidence-based policies. And one of the uh, important problem is lack of business skills and entrepreneurship uh, related know-how in Georgia. Mostly arts education still challenges the old style methods and environment. This has started to change in the last years, but still a lot has to be done in this regard. From this point forward, I will give the floor to Annie and she will continue talking about other challenges hindering creative economy development in Georgia. Uh, thank you, Elena. Yes. So, hello, everyone. I will proceed with the uh, challenges and then academic perspective and solutions uh, uh, and its uh, direction. So, Georgia has prioritized knowledge based and innovation driven economy development and also the private sector oriented development and pos positioned the its uh, um, strategic location in the Caucasus and the, the region, and also created the uh, favorable conditions for the entrepreneurship, adopted law on innovation, which is uh, in compliance with the definition of uh, uh, innovation in uh, um, of OECD, and the IP alone, IP is on a place, and industrial zones are on place, uh, and also government is increasing expenditure on education. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the, as Elena mentioned, there are particular challenges existed in the art institutions and at the universities. Um, uh, the particular um, challenges are the lack of human capital development towards industry four and also the uh, existing gap between the industry and science. Next slide, please. Um, so the, um, the main uh, event uh, during this pandemic was uh, entering uh, international accelerator to Georgia. 500 startups entered to, to Georgia uh, with the um, aim to cover the region and uh, uh, some of the universities, including business and technology university, our university has joined as a, uh, um, has benefited with the 500 Georgia towards uh, top accelerator, which is TOT component and we started pre accelerating and uh, together with us uh, several universities were included in this and uh, some other service providers were included in this but still this is uh, the um, um, existed problem um, that the um, entrepreneurship skills are lacking uh, um, among the uh, society um, and the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia uh, also created the um, program which is technology transfer pilot program uh, and this uh, program is uh, aim is to support commercialization of um, Georgia scientific results and respond to the market needs and one of the objectives of this technology transfer pilot is uh, examine either uh, inventions coming from public universities and research institutions have commercial commercialization viability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we came up with these uh, solutions uh, that uh, um, there is um, particular attention shall be paid to the working on the innovation policy for digital transformation for skills development and and uh, for developing the particular sectors such as AI or biotech or, or life science um, sector and also the preparing society uh, towards industry four with entrepreneurship trainings and the pre-accelerations and acceleration programs and uh, the um, third solution surely is scaling up the technology transfer pilot program um, uh, uh, um, in increase the awareness regarding the patent opportunities at the universities and also the um, opportunities for the university researcher and the um, private sector and the um, um, regarding the commercialization of the projects and the particular um, dividing the share um, and the creation of the legislation in this direction. Next slide please. 
Um, and we came up with the idea that there's a huge potential for Georgia uh, with this technology transfer pilot project to be scaled up with the ICT skills development and uh, some other tax incentives, such as uh, recently was adopted um, the employer tax on um, ICT uh, companies from the international market is reduced for 5% and already two international companies entered to Georgia. So it, it's a good motivation for the society to be prepared for the future professions and to become a Silicon Valley of Caucasus. Thank you, Jess. Thank you very much. Oh, um, oh no, we're not finished. We're not finished. I've got a little bit more. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hope the time is. Um, I'm, I'm, the time just, um, I'm got like two more slides and then um, it will be done. Um, so okay. this is the launch of, as I said, the soft launch of um, a piece of research that um, kind of Elena and I did in run up to the UK's United Nations Climate Change Conference. Um, and it's just a little bit of visualization. Um, we found that quite a lot of people know what digital skills are, which is a really good indicator for um, the creative economy in Georgia. However, a lot of people feel very challenged by entrepreneurship skills. And the, the statistics speak for itself. At the same time, um, we noted a number of challenges that people are facing, both in terms of lack of understanding, social stigma. One of the biggest was a lack of funding um, within the Georgian um, context. And some of the responses we've had are challenges across um, female entrepreneurship, the challenges around education, as Annie and Elena mentioned, but also around um, kind of the, the infrastructure as a whole. So um, thank you so much. And um, yeah, if you need to get in touch with us, you can chat, you can find us here. Thanks again. This was a, a very interesting presentation. I'm sure we will all have a lot of questions to you. Um, moving forward with our today's, today's panel, um, we will be having Andrea Weiss is our presenter. She will be presenting a joint research with Francisca Smolnik and Susan Fellings. Mariam. Um, yes, thank you. Before we move on to the next presentation, I would like to make a quick announcement. We will be uh, stopping, pausing the uh, recording of this presentation and we will be pausing um, well, better say stopping the live streaming for this presentation uh, per request from the presenters and authors. So I will just session. moving with the QA session. Hence, please um, just um, drop your questions in the chat or voice them, um, please. Are there any questions to any to the participants? Mm -hmm. um, there is a question to Elena. What do you think are the next steps for Georgia? Okay, hi once again. Thanks just for this question. Um, I think the next step is to finally realize the huge potential of creative economy and then work like together. I mean, first the ministries of culture, ministries of economy and different agencies to create the necessary preconditions for the sector to flourish and to develop and to focus on capacity building and supporting uh, creative uh, skills development. I mean, entrepreneurship related skills development. Thanks. Thanks, Elena, for the answer. Um, Mariam, do we have questions on Facebook? No, we do not have uh, questions for the for this panel from Facebook. 
Okay. Then I'll, I'll have a question to Elena, Annie, and Jess again. Um, you said there is a gap between industry and science. What role, in your opinion, think tanks play in this, in Georgia, let's say? Oh, I'll weigh in a little bit and then Elena and Annie can, can kick off with the more Georgian focused approach. I think, um, I think everywhere there's a, a gap between industry and, and policy and science. We see that in every country. Georgia is no exception. Um, the challenge might be a bit bigger because you're earlier on in the journey. Um, again, in this case of the UK, we, we brought in the creative economy and the creative industries as part of policy in the 1990s. Um, so we're many, many years ahead, but I think you know, those challenges aren't new. They're not unique to Georgia, um, but I would say in terms of think tanks and the role that think tanks have, I would say um, creating spaces for, um, I guess, knowledge exchange, facilitation, um, networks. I mean, I say this both as a civil servant myself and an academic and also as a researcher. Think tanks are, um, I would say, much like civil society, vital in that demographic and that kind of nexus. But I'll let Elena and Annie weigh in. Um, thank you, Jess. So I will add a few words. So uh, I, I agree, of course, that the think tank uh, play um, really crucial role in the uh, creation of the platforms where the representatives from the industry, science and civil society and policymakers meet. Uh, so we have several good practices to organize the conferences, the meetups, and also uh, in order to uh, listen to the um, top-down and bottom approach uh, from the main stakeholders and also um, sharing the um, scientific solutions with the policymakers in order to give them opportunity to uh, examine the results of the um, strategies and, uh, and the legislation which, uh, on which they are working. Thank you, Ani. Okay, I, I would just uh, really uh, brief note that I think that it is very important that, th that think tanks are involved in this process, but I'd say that in Georgia, the problem is that not only think tanks, the general society uh, doesn't perceive creative economy as the serious field of economy. So uh, not much of like different organizations work in, on this, like, um, we have to do a lot to develop this direction and then like different kinds of organizations will be involved in this process so the first is awareness raising and to know that this is important this is really important thank you very much uh, and because we i think still don't have any other questions i will use my privilege of being the <laughs> the the um leader of this panel and ask the question to Zulfia. Um, you mentioned about Zulfia digital literacy. Um, do you have more specific examples of what has been done in different cities uh, to increase the digital city and to perhaps enhance uh, the concept of the smart city in their, yeah, in their uh, specific context? So you mean for Baku, right? Uh, the increase uh, of digital literacy. It may, maybe, yes, for Baku. And also maybe you came up with interesting examples from your literature review. Uh, okay, um, so digital literacy, I mean, especially for Baku, uh, is like uh, the recent developments uh, in terms of uh, the services of governmental authorities. Like, um, as I mentioned, for example, people uh, never also, for example, in Azerbaijan, what's the case? Uh, the government develops faster than the digital literacy. 
So people like there are certain services, but people don't get it. But after uh, COVID-19, people were obliged to get those services online because whenever they were going to those offices, the people were saying, the officers were saying that, no, you can't come here. You should get it online. And afterwards, they were forced to get all of this online. And it goes to the development uh, of the digital literacy in Baku. I'm sorry that's the background for background noise. Uh, so uh, it's the case for Baku, uh, but uh, for, for other countries, I didn't honestly research one specific country. I just uh, researched the concepts uh, overall and uh, find, find, found uh, some examples, but I don't have any information about one specific country that how, uh, which kind of methods they used uh, to make it uh, more, um, uh, to develop this digital literacy. Thank you very much uh, for your answer, Zufia. I see there is a question to Andrea. Uh, Lawrence Boyers raised the question. Um, you mentioned four dimensions and three thematic areas to this connectivity. Andrea, maybe you've read the question already. Uh, in the framework of two geographies, how do you define the geographic sco scope of this connectivity? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, this indeed uh, very good question. Um, what I think I, I need to emphasize is that basically the three areas we picked uh, is um, on the one hand because we think they, uh, they are important, but also on the other hand because they are our, they are our research focuses. So uh, the three of us have been working on the Caucasus uh, for quite, quite some time and uh, so uh, we built on previous experiences um that that's one so uh you could also you choose uh, three other dimensions or frame them in a different way um in terms of this connectivity it's not that we uh what we don't want to do is to predefine uh areas uh in the sense of uh any fixed uh with any fixed boundaries for us it's more important kind of in terms of imaginaries and in terms of practices, which boundaries arise and which boundaries are sort of overcome in which ways. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's kind of, it's more like a heuristic lens, more like a heuristic framework to, um, to give an opportunity to see how we can, how we can uh, tackle what is there empirically uh, and empirical complexities. And, and then kind of uh, translate them into more uh, more general more general findings and then more general kind of um, analysis framework. I, I hope this is uh, I hope this answers your question. I think if you want to, uh, whoever writes to us, we can also uh, we can also uh, upon uh, individual requests. We I think we would be happy to share our working paper if you want to. So please do come up to come up to come back to us. Thank you. Dear participants of this panel, thank you very much for your attention, participation, and special thanks to all presenters whose contacts you already have and would probably get in touch with them afterwards when you have questions to them. Um, by this, I would like to wrap up this panel and let you have some rest before the continuation of our conference today. Uh, so please get back to us by 1.45 for the rest of the day and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, hello, welcome back everyone. Um, now we will resume our conference with the fourth panel, which is about conflict transformation prospects in the South Caucasus, and it is moderated by Dr. Guranda Bursulaya. Um, thank you very much for leading this panel and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Mariam, very much for my presentation. Um, welcome to the panel, Prospects on Conflict Transformation in the South Caucasus. I am very excited that we are going to have a four uh, very interesting presentations. Um, my name is Guranda Bursulaya, and I will facilitate this session. Um, I would like to say a couple of the words about technicalities. So each presenter, we will have four of them. I will have 15 minutes for um, presenting their works with us. And after that, we hear all four of them, we will have a 15 minutes for Q&A session. Without any further ado, I would like to give a floor to our first speaker, who is Claudia Detail, And she will present with us her PhD research on peace building in Nagorno-Karabakh, a gender perspective. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very excited particularly to hear a, because I know that she has a very unique stories from the ground, uh, from her interviews with the women and, they, uh, and their um, active participation in confidence building uh, in this regard. So please, uh, Claudia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. I hope that all of you can hear me well. Uh, then I will uh, go with the sharing of my presentation. I hope all of you can see. Uh, okay. And not yet, but it should come probably in a minute. Okay. Okay. Ah, yes. Now we can. Okay. See. Perfect. So I will start. So uh, today I'm going to present my PhD project, Peace Building in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, Gender Perspective. I am a first year PhD student. So uh, my methodology uh, uh, is still a work in progress. and. For this reason, I um, really welcome any kinds of feedbacks and comments on, on your side. Uh, first, I will not pause long about the political, geopolitical situation in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and South Caucasus in general. So I just want to say that uh, the November ceasefire um, agreement uh, between the leaders of Azerbaijan, Armenia and uh, Russia was signed behind closed doors in uh, an authoritarian conflict uh, management approach in which, uh, once again, uh, the um, debates with the civil society, with the grassroots population in the region was set aside. Uh, and uh, despite the leaders of the uh, three uh, nations did not um, decide to uh, boost the implementation of infrastructural projects in the region to open a bit the borders and boost the possibility for more people-to-people -people contact in the future, the security dilemma uh, is likely to stay high as the last stations um, along the, the border uh, recently uh, have shown. So on one side, we have this approach. On the other side, another prevalent approach is the uh, liberal approach of the uh, Western organization intervening in the conflict. First of all, the OCE Minsk Group, and second of all, also the European Union with the European Neighbor Policy. Uh, this is, they adopt basically a democratic peace approach we, because they insist more on the democratization of the institutions, for example, with free and fair elections because uh, on a Western-like model. So, and they, in my opinion, miss the peculiarities of the conflict and miss um, uh, a dialogue with the grassroots population and involvement, once again, of the uh, civil societies to a significant level in the conflict transformation process. Uh, and this is, once again, a top-down process. So, um, I will focus in my presentation on uh, a post-liberal approaches to the conflict transformation, I will explain why, in my opinion, it is important to involve more uh, the um, grassroots population, but especially uh, women for many reasons. The first is that women uh, um, in both Armenian and Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh, regardless of their nationality, they experience the conflict in a really similar 
manner. Uh, first, regarding the direct impact of the conflicts. Um, after, the, uh, after the last war, many, um, uh, many, uh, a great part of the population was forced uh, to flee their houses, uh, to live in hosting facilities with poor sanitarian conditions, uh, with pure humanitarian assistance and gender sensitive approaches. The only uh, humanitarian international aid comes from the uh, Red Cross. Um, uh, and uh, also many basic facilities were destroyed during the conflict, uh, hospitals, etc. cetera. So for, with devastating effects for women, and we should not forget that uh, due to the use of cluster munitions and landmines uh, today, some territories of Nagorno-Karabakh are highly contaminated by uh, mines and other and, and exploded remnants of war, um, uh, further complicating the um, uh, situation. And further complicating the return of uh, refugees anytime soon. Uh, then I will focus more on the indirect and long term impacts of a protracted conflict, which generated uh, highly militarized society, highly militarized uh, discourses uh, in both society with uh, poor out on women in forms on sharp gender stereotypes, in which the main purpose of the men is to uh, defend the homeland, defend the women. Uh, and the, the, the women uh, race have more a passive role uh, with um, uh, the task of giving birth to future soldiers. Uh, it is not a, by chance that Armenian and Azerbaijan present uh, two of the highest rates uh, among the, the world uh, for uh, some preferences at birth than sex selective um, abortions. And, um, uh, also, um, the economic insecurity is another uh, uh, consequence of the war because in patriarchal societies in general for women is uh, more difficult to find well-paid positions, uh, to access uh, proper education, and uh, in um, uh, this uh, pauperization of women is even exacerbating during war times, uh, in which women uh, become a leader of a single-headed household um and they have to provide for them uh family for the uh, for the children uh and the economic insecurity of women increase they are sometimes forced to turn to uh survival strategies in the black market illegal activities like for example selling even homemade drugs or turn to prostitution activities and another consequence of the war for example, is the uh, proliferation of small arms and light weapons, even if there are no clear data about this phenomenon in, uh, with regard to the South Caucasus, but in general, it's something really common um, uh, after the war and during war times in general. And uh, um, another fact um, is that um, in general, uh, most of the resources uh, are uh, diverted into the military sector, and so uh, uh, there are less resources invested in the welfare sector, uh, assistance to victims of domestic violence, which in uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan is really high, so there are few resources for uh, hotlines, shelters for victims of domestic violence. And for all these reasons, women usually are, uh, um, usually, uh, construct um, anti-war uh, narratives. And it is not by chance that in both Armenian and Azerbaijan, uh, uh, peace uh, feminists are advocating also for the, um, uh, for, uh, the um, ratification of the Istanbul Conventions against violence against uh, women. And, uh, uh, and uh, I consider that um, in general women are uh, develop this anti-war narrative and they are more eager to engage in a dialogue with the other side to contrast the dehumanizing and othering narrative that uh, come from the top and uh, for all this this is the first reason why to include women in uh, uh, peace building negotiations uh, and in a, in a post-conflict reconstruction and interethnic dialogue this is for example uh, the case of women in black in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, but also women in pink in the Iraqi war of 2003. So is uh, uh, women in general have proved to be 
more eager to engage in this kind of dialogue and, um, and, uh, and to find new points of belonging across the borders, across the region. And um, another reason is uh, because um, women could be also empowered in post-conflict reconstruction scenario, uh, could receive an income for uh, the first time and to contribute to the dev development of their society in an active way and so also to um, uh, have a wider decision making within uh, not only the household, but also within the um, community. And uh, this is to mitigate, uh, to, to maintain in the long term, the relaxation of gender roles that you have during the war in which women become more active, but then come back to the, a marginalized position. It is important to intervene to maintain this in the long term and eventually um, uh, when uh, peace agreement uh, reached with um, uh, a greater presence of women into the negotiations process uh, proved to uh, give birth to a more stable uh, peace agreement instead of weak temporary uh, violating ceasefire. Uh, so um, I will um, I'll take into consideration two theoretical models um, that I would like to prove uh, uh, in the context. And the first is from John Paul Lederach's multi-track approach, uh, which considered how it is not only important to um, invest in negotiations at the track one level, so between uh, the, the top leaders of the parties, but also on the track uh, two level, so involving the uh, academic intellectuals, representatives of the civil society, but it's most importantly is to invest in the track three level. Uh, which is the base of the pyramid, but also the greatest parts and consider the common people, uh, even uh, people from refugee camp and in general, it focus on grassroots initiatives. And then the others, uh, the second theoretical model that I take into consideration is Etienne Wenger's concept of communities of practices. Uh, a communities of practice according to this learning theory, to these sociological theories, is a bunch of people engaged in a process of collective learning in a shared domain of human endeavor. So basically people uh, that uh, cooperate in an everyday um, level that interact in an everyday level on uh, projects of common interests. And this is especially useful in a post conflict scenario when it is important to address the basic needs uh, in the aftermath of a conflict, which in, in the case of Nagorno Karabakh are, for example, the establishment of early warning systems for victims uh, of violence, of gender based violence, but uh, also. Yeah. A, a shelter and hotline coordination, for example, joint management of water resources, mine actions, activities to contrast with proliferation of small arms and light weapons. This is just some example that I took from other successful stories uh, in the world with regard to engagement of women in post conflict reconstruction. Uh, and all these approaches can be um, considered under the umbrella of post liberal approaches in the South Caucasus that's, um, that I want to address. Uh, only uh, through meetings and conferences, uh, the discourse around peace and war, but uh, tackle the basic needs of the population and try to establish um, a, a dialogue on uh, common common issues. Uh, this, for example, is an approach that would use to uh, study um, uh, the peaceful, um, uh, the, some peaceful situation in which Armenian and that Azerbaijan live in some bordering uh, regions of Georgia, uh, they, uh, in which there is a heritage of the collected farms in which Armenian and Azerbaijan were engaged together. Even after these um, farms were uh, dismantled after the collapse of the Soviet Union, these ties uh, maintaining the society, and there are still villages in um, Georgia in which the uh, order in the humanizing rhetoric is weaker than in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Nagorno-Karabakh. And eventually, uh, these approaches can be um, applied to uh, find out new directions to implement the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and uh, security in, in the Caucasus. And in order to do that, the questions that I'm investigating in my project is what are the, are, what are the main factors that contribute to difference in narratives in some women? And what kind of point of belonging or common patterns across the border can be identified? And to what extent these narratives can suggest new approaches? Uh, 
The methodology that I would like to use is based on oral history. And uh, I would like to use open-ending semi-structured interview with the women from the region, and then adopt a content analysis under our, our constructive lens. So basically, because I consider that gender is a constructive uh, phenomenon, is constructive performance, and that the structure, so the overall um, uh, sum of uh, values, discourses in the society can be negotiated and reinterpreted according to some uh, contingencies, grounding contingencies, then my presentation uh, finishes here because I don't want to run out of time. Uh, but uh, you are really welcome to address me with uh, questions, comments, and even on my uh, email that I uh, put here at the end of my presentation. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia, not only for content wise, very interesting presentation, but also for being very time efficient. And thank you for sharing with us what's the role of women in general in peace building process and what is the current standpoint in that regard in um, Nagorno-Karabakh context. Mm -hmm. So let's move to our next presenter, who is uh, Javad Bey Halilzada. And he will be presenting a paper on the ethos of Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, social psychological analysis of obstacles to peace in Karabakh conflict. His work is based on research of master victimization and enemy ethnicization narratives. So uh, please, um, the floor is yours. Uh, do we have a job? At, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. We can see the screen. Yeah, we can see the presentation. Uh, but we hear some background voice. I hope it's not only me. And uh, yeah, now it's perfect. Good. I think he's uh, muted. Okay. Uh, so what do you have? Uh... Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nami. So uh, let me begin <laughs> again. So it is a preliminary stage. Still, I am uh, thinking about my methodology and also like a primary first-hand data to uh, like increase my uh, findings of my study. So and also it should be. I should note that it is a uh, exploratory study so uh, i i make a meta narrative of uh, narratives of armenians and azerbaijanis on nagorno karabakh so uh, what this uh, presentation we, would be like like it is like i use constructivist approach because uh, i believe that armenians perception of azerbaijanis and azerbaijanis perception of armenians are constructed mutually so, so therefore I use constructivist approach, study use interviews of state officials. I, I cannot make get interview of them. So I use their interviews with uh, like a journalists, like uh, news channels or uh, from the uh, scholarly studies. Uh, so uh, I will first explain what is the ethos of intractable content conflicts, intellectual construction of ethos, I, uh, I, then I will uh, differentiate three pillars of the uh, ethos in Armenia and Azerbaijani conflict, which intellectual, political, and social basis of this uh, ethos. So uh, how conflict ethos breed uh, enmity in intractable conflicts? I use Bartal's theory to explain uh, ethos of uh, Armenia-Azerbaijani conflict. So intractable conflicts are purely psychological, such as viewing them as being existential, irresolvable, and zero-sum nature. Nagorno-Karabakh, in, in this sense, is uh, 
intractable conflict, protracted, perceived as irreversible, social and material investment, both countries as in our previous presenter also made that uh, it is really a militarized region. region. Zero sum in nature, parties do not want to compromise from their uh, objectives and central in societies. I think like main theme in both societies. Conflict persists for a long time, at least a generation, which means that at least one generation didn't know another reality. Even uh, uh, I am thinking about to extend the uh, like a generational uh, explanation of the conflict, particularly most of the studies folks like nine, uh, since 1988 till today. However, I believe that like uh, this uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflicts issues have like when states first time get their independence, uh, who controls them? Uh, in 1990, when Armenian and Azerbaijani republics established it first time. Ethos, uh, what is ethos? It's a configuration of shared central society, societal beliefs that provide a dominant orientation to society. These beliefs illuminate the present state of affairs and conditions and set goals for the future. It is Bartal's definition. And there is eight themes of ethos about justness of own goals, uh, about security, positive collective self-image, victimiza victimization of ones, and uh, uh, aggress presenting as aggressor the other, uh, patriotism, and you can include everything, adversary and uh, inhumanity of adversary, dehumanization, uh, like a consolidation of societies, like we, we saw it in the uh, first Karabakh, let's say, first Karabakh in 1990s, how Armenian society consolidated against Azerbaijan, uh, like in the Karabakh issue. And we saw it how uh, Azerbaijani society consolidated in second Karabakh war. Societal beliefs of peace, refer to peace as the ultimate desire of the society. So it means that if we can agree peace only if our objectives uh, like uh, sustain it. Our objectives uh, is achieved. So ethos of Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, I think Armenian perception of unjust subordination of Nagorno-Karabakh to the jurisdiction of the Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan Cesera. So since we, uh, since uh, Armenia object that uh, in, during the, two years independent period of this countries, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was not under authority of uh, Azerbaijan, and it is unjustly uh, given to Azerbaijan. Uh, and perception of great Armenia, Wilsonian Armenia, or like uh, we saw it uh, in like school books, uh, in even, for instance, uh, there is a, a humanitarian aid sent in the second Nagorno-Karabakh, well, from France uh, to Armenia, even in this uh, news, they gave a photo of the uh, this aid uh, in front of the great Armenian map. In the Soviet period, period Armenian scholars con constructed a narrative presenting Armenians uh, indigenous as the region, but Azerbaijanis as latecomers. Particularly, it is very uh, like a widely discussed issue between two societies, who came late, who is the indigenous. Uh, Azerbaijanis also, uh, I don't just focus on uh, Armenian side, Azerbaijan also developed counter narrative, constructing Azerbaijanis as the heritage of Albania and Armenians as settlers after the Russian invasion. So they neglecting uh, when the Safavid Armenian removed it from these territories and uh, later when the uh, Russian Empire uh, settled uh, Armenians from Ottoman Empire and Iran as a, to increase like a, a Christian solidarity and get support from Armenians. So Great Azerbaijan also, I should, I miss it to put that uh, Azerbaijan also particularly, it is very uh, widespread in Azerbaijani society, how Piotr's, Peter the Great's uh, Armenian uh, plans was uh, like a 
administrated and uh, Azer in Azerbaijani society, it's widely discussed. It is 200 years plan to uh, build Armenian state in this region and this kind of like a uh, issue. So intellect, there is, as I said, there are three intellect uh, pillars of this ethos in both society, intellectual grounds of conflict narrative. Ar Armenian intellectuals are constantly demands on Nagorno-Karabakh. First, it's uh, first time, I think, if I am not wrong, uh, it began when uh, the Stalin uh, Soviet Union have a territorial, territorial claims for, on Ottoman Empire. They, uh, Arme uh, Armenian's representative also give a petition transfer of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Uh, Armenian historiography focused on writing national identity and grounding claims on regional territories. So uh, Galoyan, uh, Melikan. Saparov is a, uh, as, uh, is a new, uh, maybe some will uh, like confuse that Saparov, Arsene Saparov is uh, very recent scholar and still active. Like, I mean that it is not like a very old age. So I think that it is, I, I see Saparov's uh, study autonomy of the conflict uh, in the Caucasus and Farid Shafiev's studies in Azerbaijan as a forced settlement. Maybe I uh, spelled wrong the book's names. I have both of them. I see that them as a continuation of intellectual struggle of, uh, to sustain to uh, consolidate claims of uh, both society. So National United Party and more often than not history. So it is a uh, Panosinian's statement about Armenian histori historiography on, on issues building ethnos. More often than not history was a weapon or at the very least a tool through which national rights were defended and advanced. Many of these weapons were put to use to educate and to fuel the Karabakh movement in 1988. So when uh, these intellectuals uh, begin from the 1940s uh, and 1960s, it uh, transformed into conflict in 1980s. Azerbaijani counter arguments also, for instance, uh, divided Azerbaijan in Bakhdiyar uh, Vahabzadeh's Julistan poem. Uh, we patriotically uh, read this poem in our school period. So Ziya Vinyadov and Igrar Aliyev's uh, that claims uh, and intellectual studies on Albania and also Armenian erased Albanian heritage and Azerbaijan protector of this heritage. And it is continued today after like the recent, uh, uh, like after uh, transfer of this Kalbajar and Latsen and some historical uh, monuments. This still continue. Abolishment of uh, Albania Apostolic Church and settlements of uh, the Armenians in the Caucasus after 1828. So this is our Azerbaijani intellectuals as a counter argument to Armenian intellectuals. Political di dimension of the conflict. Unification of the Karabakh with Armenia. Azerbaijani discrimination toward Karabakh Armenians. That this was their main claim during this period that therefore actually Armenians demanded uh, due to this discrimination. But one of them like a first of some of, one of the first studies on this anthropological studies, Yamskov, Russian Yamskov study says that it is more than ethno-democratic causes than economic factors and it is also uh, later uh, revealed that actually Nagorno-Karabakh economic status was higher than comparing other part of Azerbaijan. The threat of security, Kaufman ex explained as a uh, mob uh, how to say threat of uh, mass people of security. Azerbaijan and Armenians are ethnically incompatible. It is also I think that uh, Kotsarians in early 2000s claimed this. Enduring rivalry, and uh, probably he's also listening to us, uh, Dr. Lawrence Browers, uh, like present Armenia, Azerbaijan as a, uh, not just Nagorno-Karabakh, but as enduring rivalry. And uh, it, I, I should also uh, mention that in both states, both countries, I am, uh, uh, both countries, 
uh, governments and leaders not uh, use it. Of course, there is some opportunistic leaders, uh, for instance, Kotsarian, in, even in his book, claimed that I wouldn't be a president of Armenia if Soviet system continued. So uh, there, there were some uh, opportunist politicians that used this uh, conflict, but uh, this Nagorno-Karabakh was not elite-lead conflict. Therefore, I, 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 I say that these three pillars consolidate, support each other, and uh, social base of the country. I think that I, I uh, CRC don't have a, a Caucasus barometer, don't have a like a, a data for Azerbaijan after 2013. Therefore, I just compared 2013 the data and uh, it is like main friend and main enemy of the Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, main friend of Azerbaijan is Turkey and uh, Armenia is Russia and main enemy of Azerbaijan is Ar Armenia and Russia and Armenia is Turkey and Azerbaijan. So it is uh, almost same uh, like a two different uh, face of the same stone. So uh, and this goes in the social base and educational level. It's also government policies in both. And also it is a social demand from governments, their governments. Renewed ethnic hatred between two nations causes the emergence of a security dilemma. And Armenians trauma was one of the main factors that caused violent conflict. It is two uh, explanation about the, the emergence of the uh, 1990s conflict. And Sungai and Baku program accelerated security threats. It also increased the victimhood and blaming the other narrative. So Armenian perception of the Azerbaijan and dehumanization. I just want to put dehumanization here. I don't want how they like uh, like uh, present Azerbaijanis like a barbar and this kind of stuff. And it is also same for Azerbaijanis and transforming this of occupied territories. Uh, of surrounding regions of nagorno karabakh as a liberated regions. For instance, uh, in recent years, like in, after uh, 2005 or 2010, the discourse occupied of territories changed to liberated territories in Ar Armenian social uh, uh, base of ethos. So in Azerbaijan, perception of Armenians not uh, positive, definitely. Uh, like uh, as dehumanization is full degree, uh, revival of territorial claims and denialism of Armenians, Armenians as a local people of this Caucasus, Khojale and development of the narrative of the victimhood and historical events that Armenians massacred Azerbaijanis. I should say that 1905 and uh, 1918 uh, March massacre in Baku between Dashnaks and uh, and particularly uh, uh, Bolsheviks, uh, Stefan Shamians, uh, it is, he was Bolshevik, not as an Armenian, presenting Armenian identity. Anyway, uh, so this presented in uh, Azerbaijan as a contra argument to victimhood uh, and the de delete demise of Armenian arguments and dehumanization of Armenians in social and educational level is full scale. So what this shows, uh, it is gives insight us that how this ethos uh, presented in each, in three <clears throat> pillars, I'm sorry. And each support each other and maintain this ethos. So it is very difficult. For instance, uh, probably most of you now, you are familiar with Akram Eilisli's uh, publication. So, so it is very difficult to change this ethos in these countries. For instance, also uh, uh, Levan Terpatrians, uh, like a intention about compromise and finding solution uh, resulted uh, replacement of his uh, government, like uh, he replaced by Kocharya. So these um, uh, constructive na narratives keep uh, conflict, 
and uh, dehumanization victim hand and in in enmity further it consolidated after last year's uh, uh, war and I, I i i believe that it is very hard like uh, to transform this narrative i would be wanted to be optimistic but i am i am but i can't say that i am optimist about finding peace but what we can do it's like we can if we can reflect uh, like this what are the psychological aspects if we correctly find the disease so we can cure it so i hope that peace after at least last recent conflict this if economic uh, routes are op will be opened and uh, i hope that the conflict will go to the positive direction and that's all about my uh, presentation and i would welcome uh, questions with, which with every aspect of the presentation because i as i said i am still in the preliminary stage of this uh, started therefore i am really thank to the, you as well that uh, gave me this opportunity to present it thank you so much javad bay for highlighting for us uh, the main dimensions and pillars of uh, Azerbaijani and Armenian dominant narratives over Nagorno-Karabakh. That was really very interesting. And let me introduce you the next speaker who is Nona Shah Nazarian. And she will talk about the role of Nagorno-Karabakh civil society, life under the new status quo. She scrutinizes uh, the dynamics on the ground uh, through uh, self-ethnography and uh, numerous physical or virtual field visits to the region. So I'm very excited to uh, hear her presentation. Please, Nona, over to you. Uh, hi, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you today. Uh, and it's double great pleasure to speak about methodology and ethics uh, and during the field work. Can you see field work? Can you see my uh, presentation, please? Yes, we see and we hear you well. So please continue. Great, great. Yes. So my, my presentation today is touches upon uh, some in geopolitical, some great geopolitical uh, changes we experienced um, uh, last times. Uh, this is also about uh, how civil society uh, actually behave in this situation and, and also about ethical uh, issue of um, uh, working as a crisis anthropologist uh, in the context of uh, war and post-war societies. Um, the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war has reshaped regional power relations in the South Caucasus, bringing in uh, new actors, Turkey and Russian peacekeepers, and ob obliterating others, the Minsk group. As you know, uh, the uh, now commonly called 44 days uh, war between Azerbaijan and the Armenian forces ended with a sweeping defeat for Armenia, which lost three quarter of the territory it had conquered in 1994, including the region of Hadrut and Shushi or Shusha, uh, within the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave itself, leaving some 40,000 Armenians permanently displaced. The war has been extremely destructive, and we today count more than 4,000 dead soldiers, with numbers. Uh, continually growing as search operations uh, continue and find new bodies between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, disappeared and 10,000 uh, wounded. There have also been 77 civilian death and uh, apparently around 200 uh, prisoners of war currently held by Azerbaijan, including 60 of them taken after the signing of the ceasefire. The important destructions, mainly civilian infrastructure, uh, and um, uh, the Azeri forces are now very close to the Armenian settlements. Some villages are even cut into 
with one part being under the Azeri forces and the other still controlled by the Armenians. Uh, as per the trilateral deal signed by Azerbaijan, Armenia and Russia on November 10, Armenia also agreed to withdraw all her military forces from Nagorno-Karabakh, thus officially surrendering her role as the guarantor of uh, Karabakh uh, security. This role has been taken on entirely by the Russian troops, who contrary to other de facto states in the post-Soviet area, Abkhazia, uh, South Ossetia, Transnistria, have had no presence in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh up to last November. Um, their deployment in what is internationally recognized Azerbaijani territory is an important new factor with uh, new implications for the region. What do these transformations mean for the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh and how they affect the uh, lives of the people living there? These are the questions uh, I will attempt to tackle in this presentation and it's based on uh, six field trips uh, uh, we, um, uh, some of them, uh, I, I made them with my uh, colleague uh, Anita Khachaturova from uh, University, uh, Liberal University Brussels, and um, we made them uh, uh, between December 2020 and June 2021, and um, I will address the dynamics of reconstruction and repatriation and current political and social processes within Karabakh internal structures. Um, there is a lot of ambiguity with regard to the Russian peacekeepers. Uh, initially, point three of the trilateral deal says 1,960 troops armed, uh, with firearms, uh, 90 armored vehicles, and 380 motor vehicles and units of special equipment shall be deployed along the contact line in Nagorno-Karabakh and along the Latin corridor. Anyone who goes to the region today can witness that the extent of the Russian military deployment is much wider than indicated. Not only the number of troops is uh, is um, uh, is to to three times larger, but the military equipment being transferred to the region is much more elaborate and uh, vaster. Locals report that they have never seen such a quantity of military equipment. It's also not clear what their mandate is. They have a very strong presence in the Latin corridor where they have established numerous checkpoints, uh, about six to seven, and they do act as border guards. And since the end of January, they have been restricting access to Karabakh for foreign citizens. It appears that the Russians are now deciding on granting entry visa to foreigners, and it became almost impossible for journalists to get to get in, but also for many foreign humanitarian organizations. Um, in parallel with the fast deployment of Russian troops, the reconstruction of uh, Karabakh and repatriation of displaced um, um, uh, Karabakhi people has followed an extremely rapid pace. Number of measures and financial motivations have been put in place in order to bring people back from Armenia. Because of COVID, they could, couldn't go further. The president, Arai Karutinian, made a decree stating that by December 1st, all civil servants should be back to work, otherwise they would lose their positions, as many others would be ready to occupy them. We have also released a great amount of funds for reconstruction and other social issues, part of which were um, 
provided by Armenia and international organizations. So the de facto government not only committed to paying the communal expenses, gas, electricity, gas, electricity, water uh, of the population, they have also been paying rent to the absent owners of houses and apartments for refugees who settled uh, in them. This stands in stark contrast with the rules prevailing after the first uh, Karabakh war, uh, when families whose men had deserted during the war were simply ex expropriated. Most of the social programs uh, made available by the uh, Karabakhi authorities after the war require a Wi-Fi connection, which not only helps make the process more transparent, but also raise civic activity and awareness among the population in terms of what their rights and obligations are. This, uh, as, um, as observed, is having some healing effect. Their presence, however, uh, I mean, uh, Russian peacemakers' presence, however, and their complete domination of the uh, Harabari authorities is putting at risk these significant freedoms that um, Karabakhi civil society had uh, benefited from uh, and democratic processes that have been going on previous to the 2020 war. Despite the terrible war, uh, war losses and the Russian presence, uh, these moods have all, all but tarnished and it raises the question of how the Russian factor will affect uh, internal political uh, processes. Contrary to most other de facto states, Nagorno-Karabakh has been able to constitute quite sustainable and functional state institutions uh, uh, and has achieved a significant level of political autonomy. Uh, while not being a consolidated democracy or fully free and freedom house ranked Nagorno-Karabakh as partly free in 2020, it has allowed for the development of a small but active civil society. Uh, the civil society and opposition groups have intensified uh, their activities twice over the last, last years. In 2016, after the four days war, uh, when a number of opposition leaders sounded the alarm on the um, unpreparedness of the Armenian army and on the dramatic disbalance between the Azeri and Armenian military capacities, calling for reforms of the army and condemning the rampant corruption of the elites. The second time was after the 2018 Velvet Revolution in Armenia. The prospect of a similar development in Nagorno-Karabakh have intensified the activities of opposition groups who eventually got deceived um, by the election of Arai Karotinian with marked support of Nikol Pashinyan. These last elections have been largely described as fraudulent by the opposition. Just months before the war, there have been un unprecedented mobilizations in Stepanakert against the president and the ruling elites with the clothing of roads and numerous demonstrations. In some instances, uh, to counter pro provoc provocators sent by uh, the security services, the demonstrators, mostly women, started crossing the street on the pedestrian walkway back on force and forth so that no rule was violated and there would be no ground for uh, arresting protesters. The main criticism targeted the system of widespread and structural corruption, patron clientelism, criminality and theft of public resources, as well as abuse of power by the military. After the 2020 war, this momentum did not vanish and the government is under much heavier pressure now from the population than, than before. People show show up every day to the presidential office to express their discontent. They are, of course, not let in. They have let in.
demonstrations demanding the uh, resignation of the president and showing discontent with regards to new po policies taken by the government and to its management of the crisis. While, while these activities have not been widespread and consistent with a population of um, uh, uh, with the population still largely in shock and grieving, the levels of uh, frustration in the society are steadily uh, mounting. In this respect, one could uh, wonder how the Russian presence will affect further development in that um, in that direction. The human rights uh, record in the facto territories under Russian control have been all but positive. Uh, see the poor human rights records on Transnistria, South, South Ossetia, and in Eastern Ukraine. The new regulations pro prohibiting the entry to foreigners and journalists, the increased secretization, uh, increased secretization sorry, of the enclave and the growing pressure of dictatorial Azerbaijan uh, to reintegrate the rest of Karabakh will certainly have a, a, det a detrimental impact on freedom and human rights uh, of the uh, Armenian population. As to the uh, perception of people remaining to these days in Nagorno-Karabakh with regards to their security and future as an uh, imperfect uh, as the Russian present is, they only remain because they hope the Russian will not leave. No one envisages a reintegration in Azerbaijan and many still hope to reclaim the region of Shushi and Hadrut albeit through diplomatic channels. Many declare that without such an eventual eventuality, they will not stay even under the Russians. And the emergence of numerous videos of beheadings released by the Azeris, mm, and the continuous uh, uncovering of mutilated bodies and the continuous detention of prisoners of wars by Azerbaijan add to the overall feeling of insecurity and make the prospect of coexistence uh, un unimaginable, although marginal interactions do exist and might become much more frequent and visible in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, restriction on travels uh, have made it uh, much difficult for, for people to immigrate, but we have been observing a stark increase in departure over the last few months. There is a pre pervading sentiment when talking to the people there uh, that they still do not realize what happened to them and have largely unrealistic assessments of the situation. Many still believe that an international recognition of the right to self-determination might be achieved. There are also revanchist sentiments, uh, mainly among the young urban population. And while they remain marginal in comparison to the broader society, they constitute a very active and vocal group. And uh, uh, as for methodology, and uh, there is a couple of, uh, or two, two, up to three um, uh, kind of topics um, uh, I can uh, pro problematize the methodological issue. This first one is structure and agency, and the state is uh, unfinished business in, in this particular case, and there is a paradox or how to say ambiguity, if not paradox, on the one hand, uh, the security imperative in the face of Karabakh security situation, which prevents deep and democratic process. On the other hand, there is civil society activity represented some challenges who create possibility for evolution and um, change. And the structure of the state allowed for those actors um, uh, to emerge, although they are directly challenging foundation of the structure while being product of, of it. And here we can see this um, uh, dichotomy or this conflict between uh, structure and agency. Uh, we can observe how for three, 30 years, the aim of recognition of the Garabakh state has been feeding, feeding this uh, ambiguity and ethnography gives you perspectives from below where all this, uh, these processes become visible in their unfolding and brings to light the many divisions and internal conflicts that an ethnic rivalry-based approach tends to 
there is uh, um, this, this is the last one uh, there is inside the outside their interrelations uh, problem and how how breaks the intellectual distance and become an insider in my particular case and sense of knowledge Martha Nussbaum says to know drama and tragedy takes more intellectual concept and also requires lived and sensory experiences this way the researcher breaks the classic dichotomy mind uh, and body mind versus body and somehow merge mind and body i have conclusion but it seems to me you are writing here that i um i am abusing time right uh but if i have uh if i have um if I have a couple of minutes, I, I, I could go through the, um, I could go through the, um, through the slides. What, what do you think? Um, we are over the time with five minutes, but if you feel like you would like really to share something, uh, I think we will be open to hear your, what you're gonna, uh, what you want to yes. share with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, with, uh, can I, uh, is this moving or not? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. For some reason I can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to show the, uh, the photos from the, uh, from the fieldwork and uh, uh, one, one second. Uh, the only one. option would be maybe we can share uh, the presentation with um, other participants so they will be able to see it uh, afterward. What do you think? Uh, yeah. One second. No, uh, uh, now I can see it. Uh, I just want you to see a couple of um, photographs, not this. And this is just... Uh, these photos are made in uh, in Rarabakh, and I'm actually now located in Rarabakh. But I, I wanted to to show you these uh, photos from uh, from civil society protests, civil society uh, and opposition leaders protests, and sometimes it was kind of really difficult. Uh, to continue fighting and to continue move to continue this anti-corruption um, movement because sometimes there was only one uh, kind of supporter uh, and and still the demonstration and the protest uh, was continuing and here we are with this um, slogans in uh, Russian Armenian and uh, 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 English, and um, I just wrote, to be honest, I wrote a book, uh, and before the war it was closed, it was, I was about to publish it, and that was exactly about security versus democracy, between Sila, Sila of security and um, Haribdis of democracy. And right now, I don't know if this is really urgent to publish, but this is how researchers uh, just jump in into the uh, kind of real life, let's say, uh, cutting distance. And I, I really, and I forgot to tell you about spy mania and ineffectiveness of security services and about what secrecy and quote unquote secrecy and clandestine research and confidentiality actually means uh, during the field work. Um, mm, maybe that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for, for abusing time limitation. I will be happy to answer your questions.
Thank you very much, Nona, for providing us with actually the freshest news or news from the ground. That was very interesting to hear. And now let me invite uh, the last but not least, um, Nami Habasov, who will present a co-authored paper by him and Jehun Mahmudlu. And it will be about a, a war recurrence, ceasefire, and offense defense balance. This paper focuses on filling the gaps on relationship between a ceasefire and the probability and different variations of war recurrence in Nagorno Karabakh case. So, please, um, the floor is yours, Namik. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, for a nice introduction. And now I'll just uh, share my screen just a second. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Great. Okay. Perfect. So uh, I'm Nami Gabasov. I'm, I'm a PhD candidate at School of Politics and Global Studies, Arizona State University. My co-author actually is not here. So he's a, a research fellow at uh, Cornell University as, as of time now. So, um, our project is about still made uh, the ceasefire and war occurrence in uh, uh, in uh, general all the wars and also we are also looking making it uh, like a, a case study of Nag uh, Nagorno Karabakh as well. So this is uh, um, this is a picture, some picture from Nagorno Karabakh war. So it means that war occurrence is destructive and uh, because of that, it's important to study why some wars occur. And when we are looking the uh, literature, so the, that the the, uh, the motivation for our research is that um, many scholars actually have uh, have looked at the uh, post conflict settings and to explain why uh, some wars uh, occur. And uh, but when we actually look in the literature, it's more likely that they are just putting the uh, stalemate at uh, uh, and uh, the peace agreements together. So there's no disaggregation here. And also a uh, study of stalemate and ceasefire are, are mainly ignored in study of the us, uh, uh, of war recurrence. So we address this gap in literature and then we, had, uh, we ask these two questions. So why some civil wars uh, uh, recur uh, while others don't? And also we are asking why some uh, wars uh, uh, and it will see why are more likely to resume. And then when we are looking at the literature review, so there are like a lot of explanations for war recurrence and one is competitive alliances. Actually, they are saying that the uh, size of having competitive alliance is more likely to go to war after the war ends. And negotiated settlement is saying that uh, when there is a negotiated settlement then uh, it's more likely to have war uh, recurrence because uh, you don't at all destroy your enemies' uh, potential uh, tourism war. So then uh, they have more time and they can res uh, resort war again. And military victory, as special argued, that's more likely, um, uh, it's less likely to lead to, uh, to uh, go. Uh, uh, to lead to uh, war recurrence because once you destroy your enemies, uh, put the, uh, the or army, so the, your uh, uh, enemy is less likely uh, uh, to gain military uh, like uh, capabilities and start a new war against you. So this is uh, this is just like some studies uh, in the literature and uh, argue our our argument actually focused on. Uh, um, the wars that end with ceasefire or stalemate, and uh, we are disaggregating this. Uh, the war started with uh, ended with uh, sorry ended with stalemate from uh, the um, uh, negotiated settlement, and we argue that the wars ended with uh, ceasefires or stalemate are more likely to resume compared to others other outcomes. So this is because uh, we have a couple of uh, casual mechanisms here actually that lead into this wire uh, to poor recurrence. One is intractability is more likely to happen, especially in uh, uh, the wars ended with this wire. And also there is uh, always security dilemma there because uh, once, uh, once I trying to increase security actually is also uh, increases in uh, 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 making some like a dilemma for other side, and after all, we have uh, more insecurity in 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 the uh, 
in the given area. And also when there is a war ending with ceasefires, more likely that we can see militarization, arms, arms race or military innovations, uh, and uh, which actually uh, uh, makes war more likely to happen. So this is our main argument and uh, I will try to be very quickly and uh, go our method and the data. So we are using multi-method uh, uh, approach uh, to answer, uh, uh, to test our arguments. So first we are using the quantitative uh, data, uh, quantitative analysis, large and uh, regression analysis on uh, war recurrence. We are taking the Zeigler 2015 data set and uh, probably we are going to um, update data again and to include more uh, observations there. And we are using the logistic regression with robust standard errors. And, uh, and also to uh, um, supplement our quantitative effort of study, we are also taking making qualitative study, uh, case study for this war in Nagarno Karabakh. And multi-method actually is uh, here we are using integration approach. So integration is more, uh, is more uh, like we are taking Nagarno Karabakh and we, with the Nagarno Karabakh case, we are going to show special uh, the measurement issues there, how we need uh, to um, disaggregate the uh, divorce ended with stalemate uh, from the uh, wars ended with peace agreements. And these are just um, some initial results that we have found. So you can see it's very basic model. We have two models here. So uh, in both of models, we can exactly see that ceasefire uh, the wars ended with ceasefire are more likely uh, uh, to lead to wars. So you can see it's significant I, results. I am sorry, Namik. Uh, could you also move your slides? Uh, your slides do not move. So change your slides, show us results. Also, oh, so, um, could you please make them full screen if that's possible? Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. So I saw that it's uh, visible on the screen. It's visible, but it's not moving forward. Yeah. So it's oh, I guess it was the same. Okay, okay. Let me see. How can I so stop sharing? Um, you need to click every slide. Therefore, okay, I think I you cannot make a full full screen. Hopefully, this. I am sorry for this interruption. It just I wanted to see the result. Therefore, I. I am really sorry for that. No, thank you so much, actually. It's a very good reminder. I didn't know, I wasn't aware of that, actually. So, so, um, what is the, do you see the uh, old slides now? So do you see my result here, regression results? We see regression yes. results, yes. yes. Okay, yes. perfect. So I, so these are regression results. So this is the, our dependent variable for recurrence and the, um, it's called as zero and one, and those two ceasefire also called as zero and one. So we have used the um, uh, logistic regression with robust uh, results. And uh, so we will actually, we will also run the time to survival as well, because it's this, uh, this is actually, we haven't actually finished the paper yet. Probably we are going to change the model. And these are the predicted probabilities, and you can see that uh, here in for in this result, you can see that it's going from like when it's one, it's uh, uh, like this is the uh, the uh, when there is no cease, uh, like it's abs uh, there is no ceasefire, this is like forty two percent, and when there's ceasefire, it's like um like 69 percentage so we can see there is a big jump there so it's basically showing that wars ended with ceasefire are more likely uh to uh to resume and the contribution are we just hope it will make contribution to literature in terms of like studying of wars ending with ceasefire and also we hope that it will also have some policy implications there in terms of uh, uh, providing some suggestions, how to resolve like some uh, conflict that ended with ceasefire, especially we know that the wars ended with ceasefire and uh, resume and it becomes destructive, brings a lot of this uh, like instability. And also there's high use of high caliber views of the high caliber weapons actually brings more uh, destruction. 
Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, um, Namik, for focusing actually our attention on a topic which is quite uncovered, um, but yet very important, and also bringing some numbers and figures uh, to, to think about. Um, and um, so now we have a time for some questions. We are a little bit over the time, so maybe we can reduce this session for five to 10 minutes. You can raise your hand, you can write your question in the, um, in the chat, so please feel free. And we have first question from um, Hakim Alasgarov. Uh, I don't know to whom this question is addressed, so please feel free to answer whoever would likes to. And it's about, um, the role of civil society representatives when the cultural heritage uh, was uh, destroyed in uh, uh, the cities that you can see in the uh, question um, that he wrote. Um, so maybe someone would like to answer that question. Uh, I am sorry for uh, interruption. It is probably for Nona. Uh, as I see, it is like a, a control read. Well, it, yeah, it looks like that. Can you please, can you please repeat it for me? Sorry. And and the chat is disabled, Guranda. Please. What is disabled? Sorry, the chat I don't... is disabled. Uh, what uh, what does it mean? <laughs> you do you cannot it's see not... the chat? Uh, I see, but I can't uh, write something. Oh, uh, I think in this case we will need the help of organizers. Uh, actually, there are no uh, no chat limitations in any way, so I don't know why that would be disabled. It looks like uh, it's open for everyone. I don't yeah. Know. So, the so same question the was, uh, I'm sorry. Please for go me. ahead, Javad Bey, please. please. Yes. Uh, what is Hachim's, I just repeat Hachim's questions. Mm -hmm. to Nona, uh, what was the role of civil society organization of Karabakh? When Armenian totally destroyed Aghdam Fizuli and Zabrai cities, like uh, homes, houses, historical, cultural places of Azerbaijan's, what role of the Armenian civil society organizations was there? Uh, just to uh, add, he did not very... write, just not to distort the question, here is just a general question. As a civil society actor, have you also raised your voice in this issue mm -hmm. and how? Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much for this question. And I, I can uh, go to retrospective, uh, uh, kind of retrospectively uh, answer this question and right now. So I can say that um, back in 1993, uh, there is human rights activist Helsinki 88 group um, civil activist, uh, his name is Karin Ohanjanyan, who actually publicly uh, apologized um, for uh, war crime or whatever you call it for Hojalu. And actually uh, another Armenian uh, human rights activist made the same, uh, maybe Mirzoyan Armen, I forgot, I'm not sure if I remember it correctly. And also, I have to be honest that, uh, I mean, the society in, in as a whole, uh, kind of because of what happened actually since 1988, is not much interested uh, in uh, uh, in questions you actually raised, but uh, civil society activists, they, including me, myself, I can send you uh, a link uh, where I speak about Sumgait and Khojalu and, um, and Ahdam and Fizuli. And there are a couple of, uh, couple of chapters in my book on that. And if you are interested, the book in is Russian. Is in Russian, I can send it to you. Uh, and thank you very much for this question, great question. Thank you very much. And thank you also for uh, telling us about your book. I think that would be very interesting. And we have a, a hand from Lawrence, so please. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. My first question is for uh, Claudia. Um, I, I was uh, just a clarification on 
your distinct understandings of the liberal democratic peace approach and the post-liberal approach that you also mentioned in your presentation. Uh, I just wasn't quite clear what you mean exactly uh, by the post-liberal approach. So uh, clarification on that, uh, please. Um, and uh, Javad Bey, a question uh, for you. Um, you, in your paper, you discussed basically a focus on uh, elite level outputs and constructions uh, of the ethos of the conflict. So a focus on intellectuals uh, in particular. Um, there's, there's a tension there with uh, your comment, which I think is, is correct, uh, that this was not an elite led conflict as such or cannot be reduced to that dimension when we look back at the mass mobilization patterns uh, in the late 1980s. So um, it seems to me that an important question is around the, the receptivity uh, to these elite constructions um, and, and how will that fit in? Uh, you did discuss to some degree the social basis for the conflict, but what is the oper operationalization of that social basis uh, in, in your research? And just a kind of a follow-up question, um, uh, how, how will you, I mean, as an Azerbaijani researcher, how will you research the Armenian side? Um, it's obviously, you know, <laughs> difficult issues around methodology there uh, and, and presence in the field. So uh, thank you very much. If I, if I may answer the, the question. Uh, first, many thanks uh, to Lawrence Burst for your uh, question on my presentation. The way I uh, intend uh, these approaches is that um, liberal approaches are more focuses of indirectly facing the uh, conflict scenario and the stabilization of the region by investing first in um, democratizing uh, the countries. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in, uh, are based on the assumption of the democratic peace approach in which first you have to intervene in uh, boosting uh, the rule of law for elections, for example, participation of civil society to indirectly stabilize uh, the region because uh, with free and fair elections, the civil society um, uh, can, um, uh, can rise more than its voice, uh, can participate in the public debate around the conflicts. Uh, whether the post liberal approaches are, uh, I would consider them, maybe I'm wrong, but I would consider them more pragmatic in a sense that they tackle the conflict dimension uh, directly by involving the population on the, on, on the forefront. Uh, so by involving mm, the grassroots population and only the representative of civil society, not only the academics in the uh, uh, conflict reconstruction scenario. So by, for example, involving them in, in um, in project of common interest directly. Uh, I know that you also wrote about these approaches <laughs> uh, because I, I read many of uh, the, the, the papers, which I would say are very inspiring for my uh, PhD projects. So uh, I don't know if you would like to add something, some kind of clarifications to the way I intend in this uh, concept uh, in, in case I would be really glad for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claudia and Javad Bey. Maybe you can really wrap up your answer in two, three minutes. That would be really highly appreciated. Uh, your mic is yeah, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you for your question, Dr. Brewer. So uh, as I, in the beginning of my uh, like uh, presentation, I said that actually it is a trait of my uh, study that I cannot make a direct firsthand, uh, get a data from the, uh, parties like particularly Armenia and also like uh, it is very difficult to make an interview with like a certain people that I need these explanations so you know it better than me <laughs> so about the uh, how I uh, Misha, make operationalize my social base influence to elite uh, like a political dimension I, I think it would be uh, like I am thinking that it is better to explain how this like uh, any lose in this uh, uh, conflict uh, like early stage of the war for instance uh, how like in 1991 Armenians forced it and uh, Azerbaijani 
public supported uh, popular front uh, and also Soviet in 1991, particularly for Operation Ring and uh, like uh, in August, in summer of that Armenian people, elites like a uh, representative came to make a deal, the status and new uh, reality of the uh, of the understanding Karabakh in, inside Azerbaijan. So I will measure it only to uh, that uh, like uh, does not support it me, two leaders, uh, it, also they lost territories in the war. Heydar Aliyev in 1993, five regions occupied or conquered. So it is depends how, from which perspective <laughs> you uh, talk about it. So, uh, and we call Pashinyan. Actually, it's recent uh, when in election, uh, decline my narrative, like a, how to say, decline my hypothesis that P, unlike P, uh, they lost war, like I, unlike they lost territories, public supported uh, these uh, leaders. Therefore, I, I can say that, for instance, compromise and topple of the Kotsarian, uh, uh, Kotsarian uh, and replacement of Kotsarian support house social base. Also in the uh, Azerbaijan in 19, early 1990s, how popular front press it uh, with the mass demonstrations which uh, not, uh, it was elite lead demonstrations. So uh, I will try to operationalize, but as I said, I am still working on it. <laughs> Particularly in method section, I have when many like uh, uh, cannot find like a way to uh, like academically uh, support my ideas. But thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, I will take it. Thank you. Note. Thank you so much. And do we have any last questions? Well, yes, I raised my hand about uh, Claudia. I have a question about the okay. uh, uh, particularly women's role, gender perspective in Nagorno-Karabakh, even not just gender, but so civil society's role very restricted in Nagorno-Karabakh issue and uh, I think liberal also uh, peace building cannot work there because there is no third uh, actor uh, in intervention to the conflict or I see just as a uh, like a mediator not actor in the conflict so how you will measure the role of the uh, uh, gender like a perspective in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, I maybe I you explain it I missed it there. First, I should say that how we you will measure gender perspective role and also which specific like a, do you have like a uh, defined groups like a civil society groups or uh, particularly it is related to your methodology uh, part uh, because uh, since civil societies have role uh, restricted. Uh, women's role very restricted, particularly in both patriarchal states. <laughs> so uh, I, I have, the, could you uh, clarify this section to me? I am really interested in your uh, research. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment too. Uh, of course, I, I'm aware because I, uh, I already spoke to some uh, peace builder activists in Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. I tried to reach out uh, some representatives of the civil society with regard uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh, but they were not available. It's really difficult to reach them in the region. So this is kind of a challenge. Uh, I really hope that I, I will be able one day to, to reach them. This um, Speaking with other activists from the region, not from Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, they told me that uh, there are there is a, a really small focus, uh, even from the international non-governmental organizations, on the civil on the fact that the civil society in Nagorno is even more restricted. It is something that we we don't hear much about. Uh, but yes, that that um, I think one of the future challenge of the of the approaches to the post-conflict reconstruction is to try to involve more. Uh, the population of the of the Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Thank you. Uh, so Nona's hand was first. Nona, you can go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, sure. Thank you, everybody. This was great presentations, really. And I, I want to address my question to uh, Claudia, because I was doing back in uh, since two, 2000, I was doing uh, women's studies in, in Karabakh, and um, I just want to triangulate if if Claudia would be would be agree with me that the uh, the issue of uh, women uh, women activism and women contribution into peacemaking is extremely problematic topic uh, just because you see uh, this this sort of nationalism uh, you you sometimes see that men are even uh, kind of they are more peaceful than women and this maternal thinking somehow coined by uh, coined by uh, uh, this great anthropologist uh, I forgot her name Rudik Sarah Rudik uh, and sometimes it's like counterintuitive that then you can see that this maternal thinking doesn't work because they think if I lose uh, uh, if I, I, if I'm, if my three boys died during this war, then you have to fight until the end, because then why they actually should die. So this is, I think, it, it, it's like ethical code of American Anthropological Association, because there are three uh, pivotal. Uh, uh, pivotal principles and and they seem so clear and transparent but they are not you cannot apply them or in practice thank you uh, how, how, uh, mm -hmm. how would you resolve this problem this is my question action okay uh, so um, the the way I would love uh, I would like to, I would just try to try a way to reach them. Uh, maybe not directly on the territory because it's quite complicated, but maybe um, online, if it would be possible to do some research online. Then uh, I don't know how to <laughs> resolve the problem for an international organization point of view, because I don't have so much experience. I'm not in the, in the, in the sector. So uh, I don't know the way, um, uh, organization because obviously it's quite complicated because it's also interconnected with the with the, the status of Nagorno Karabakh itself. The fact that since it's not recognized, it is impossible to uh, I think welcome international organization from from abroad. So maybe with the, 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 the last COVID pandemic, those are something that uh, we can have more conferences and meetings like that online. Maybe this could be a way also to reach the population there uh, beyond the uh, difficulties uh, posed by the um, international law. Maybe this could, could be a way. I don't know. <laughs> it's quite a complicated issue. Sure. Okay, thank you. thank you so much. Um, and actually, I have a feeling that we turned the long break into a short break. <laughs> Sorry for that, but thank you very much for your participation and your interest, especially to our presenters. I see the hand of Hakim, but we actually already asked his question and I checked him uh, with him in the chat. He just had an internet problem, so he missed the answer, but maybe you can get in touch with Nona uh, directly so she can answer your question again. And in general, I encourage you, we have each other's contacts so we can always uh, you know, elaborate on each other's work and hear uh, more about each other's research. And now, uh, before we go to the break, I would just like to remind you that at 15.30, we have a chance to join for the, um, for the presentation of the last um, keynote speaker, Lawrence Brewers. So have a good break and thank you everyone.
Uh, all right. Welcome back, dear participants and dear audience. Uh, my name is David Ginawa. I am CRC Georgia's research director, and I will be uh, moderating the, uh, uh, the our last keynote speech. Um, well, uh, I think anyone who's uh, familiar with the with the region and uh, scholarly work about that knows about uh, Dr. Lawrence Brewers. Uh, but let me still do some formal introduction. Lawrence Brewers is a South Caucasus program director at London-based peace-building organization, Conciliation, Conciliation Resources. He's a researcher of conflicts in the South Caucasus and practitioner of peace-building initiatives in the region. And also he's a co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of Caucasus Survey, the first dedicated scholarly journal of the South Caucasus, of the Caucasus region which is published since January 2015 by Taylor and Francis. Proverse is the author of Armenia and Azerbaijan, Anatomy of Rivalry, uh, which was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2019, and co-editor with Galina Emilianova of the Rotlich Handbook of the Caucasus, which was published by Rotlich in 2020, and with Anna Ohanian of Armenia's Velvet Revolution, Authoritarian Decline and Civil Resistance in a Multipolar World. This book was published also in 2020 by I.B. Taurus. Dear Lawrence, welcome to our conference. We're very delighted to have you uh, uh, at our annual conference and uh, looking forward to your keynote speech. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak today. It's, uh, it's an honor. Um, I'm very sorry that I couldn't attend the conference yesterday. I was, I was in the office, um, but have very much enjoyed uh, the excellent presentations uh, today. So thanks to all of you uh, for your incredible work. Um, I, I wanted to begin my presentation uh, with a headline from the New York Times on the 11th of November last year. Great power politics is back. This summed up perhaps the dominant narrative about the South Caucasus in 2020. After Turkey's intervention in support of Azerbaijan in the Second Karabakh War and Russia's intervention to end the war, long-standing metaphors of the Caucasus as the pawn of great powers seemed vindicated and justified. The war served as a major stress test of an aging mediation structure, a test that this structure failed and it still remains in disarray. Remilitarization and war was last year's major, uh, but not only shock. The other, of course, was the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, along with the rest of the world, uh, the pandemic exposed in the South Caucasus long-standing issues relating to inequality, health security, public trust, the absence of social security nets, and the limitations on coordinated regional action by protracted conflicts. The pandemic served as a stress test of the state, uh, and its social contract with societies uh, with still uncertain outcomes. So just short of its third decade uh, of independence, it seems likely that 2020 will be regarded by future students of the South Caucasus as a major inflection point in the region's history. And to put this in context, I'd like to, to go back 30 years and to recall some of the assumptions uh, that dominated in the 1990s. Uh, in particular, assumptions of convergence in three core dimensions. Within the states of the South Caucasus, it was assumed that democratic transitions, liberalized markets, and liberal peace building would converge to stabilize and embed sovereignty. Geopolitically, it was assumed that the transitioning states of the region would in turn converge with Euro-Atlantic models and structures. And at the regional level, it was assumed that eventually, after peace building processes, the South Caucasus would itself con converge and cohere uh, to, to form uh, a regional identity and regional practice. So last year stands uh, as uh, what seems to be a stunning repudiation uh, of these assumptions. The polities of the South Caucasus remain fractured around competing principles of power and legitimacy they diverge significantly in their appetite and capacity for Euro-Atlantic integration. And rather than Europe, it is other extra-regional powers that dominate the region. In 2020, 
these powers appear to back an illiberal regional paradigm focused not on liberal democracy, but on the common interests and understandings of authoritarian powers. Now, critical hindsight on the exaggerated and even hubristic ideals of the 1990s is easy. More, more challenging is to identify a framework for understanding political phenomena in the contemporary South Caucasus beyond merely inverting the characteristics of purportedly functional regions or adopting purely geopolitical perspectives that depict the region as the passive object of external agency. Now, one such framework is the concept of regional fracture uh, as developed by my academic colleague and collaborator, Anna Ohanyan in her edited volume, Russia uh, Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture uh, in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond. Now, Ohanyan's central insight is that we should not define regions such as the South Caucasus in terms of negatives of what they are not, or in terms of an exogenously defined normative scale of regionalism that may often embed a Euro, uh, Eurocentric or liberal centric presumption of integration. Instead, Ohanyan invites us to see fractured regions as specific regional constellations featuring degrees of interdependence, social and economic interactions and institutional ties, yet which fail to generate a common infrastructure at the political level normalizing regional interactions into a stable community of common interest and regional governance. Crucially, fractured regions are often post-colonial regions and feature the fracturing effects of the former colonial power seeking to maintain its influence and su successor states seeking to embed their independence and autonomy. She highlights various dimensions of regional fracture in the domains of politics and the exercise of power in the realm of regional institutions and in the field of social identities and values. Now, I found this a very useful framework uh, for understanding the South Caucasus in various ways. And I wanted to mention it as a backdrop for examining some of the developments of the past year. What I find particularly useful about the regional fracture paradigm is its in interrogation of power and by implication of great powers. As Ohanyan observes, fractured regions are environments in which the impact of power resources, whether hard power, soft power, or economic power, is diluted and softened. Neither regional integration nor external hegemonic overlay materializes easily. Thus, regional fracture is a meso-level phenomenon between post-imperial overlay and regional integration, in which political, geopolitical and social fractures obstruct the cohering of either projects in top-down hegemonic regionalism or bottom-up networked regional integration. So with this framework in mind, uh, in this talk, I'd like to consider three aspects of fracture uh, in the light of events in 2020. I'll begin with the political fractures in the exercise of domestic power, then I'll move to the geopolitical realm and then finish in the domain of social identities. So in the political dimension, eerily evocative of the way that the coronavirus itself hit different individuals in completely different ways, each South Caucasian polity has had a different trajectory through the pandemic. The pandemic laid down a formidable challenge to one of the kinds of state power identified by Michael Mann, infrastructural power, meaning the capacity to work through society in the interests uh, of a major uh, national issue, in this case, containing the pandemic. Yet at the same time, the pandemic also offered an opportunity to another uh, category uh, of, of man's uh, state powers, despotic power, as expressed in increased surveillance, uh, emergency measures imposing restrictions on civil and political liberties, and in some cases, the targeting of politically dissident groups. Responses to the pandemic also invited a debate over the effectiveness of different regime types to external shock. Now, these are challenges that every state, recognized or otherwise, has had to confront to a greater or lesser degree across the world in the last 18 months. But what was more particular to the South Caucasus was the fact that the pandemic cascaded into the region at a time when several of its regimes were preoccupied with unfinished internal renewal. In the case of Armenia, 2018's Velvet Revolution was not yet two years old and momentum still high. In Azerbaijan, a 
a top-down overhaul of the political elite in late 2019 had appeared to stall with a parliamentary election in February 2020 that surprised even long-term Azerbaijan watchers by its failure to bring modernizers into the parliament. Georgian politics in early 2020 was still dominated by deep polarization flowing from the suppression of major protests in Tbilisi in summer 2019 and concerns over democratic backsliding. In the South Caucasus then, the pandemic amplified the, the vulnerabilities of regimes caught in unfinished and still vulnerable consolidations of power. It does not seem exaggerated to talk of a crisis in state legitimacy magnified by the prospects of the post-COVID economic recession to come, or at the very least, a critical conjuncture. So how has the state responded uh, to this critical conjuncture? Let's begin with Azerbaijan. While international motives and dynamics tend to predominate in explanations of the Second Karabakh War, in its domestic dimension, the war can also be read as a pivot in the legitimacy formula of Azerbaijan's political elite. Much like Russia, oil era Azerbaijan has practiced a rather postmodern form of authoritarianism, more reliant on public spending, co-optation, and narrative hegemony than actual coercion. Yet the peaking of Azerbaijan's oil production at the beginning of the, of the last decade, sorry, the, uh, yes, at the beginning of the last decade, combined with longer term trends towards diminishing demand for oil worldwide, has presented a rapidly approaching horizon beyond which this approach looked less viable. Now, perhaps Azerbaijan's regime dilemmas can be conceptualized in terms of Johannes Gershevsky's framework of the three pillars of authoritarian stability. Gershevsky, Gershevsky's model argues that authoritarian regimes operate through the balancing of three pillars of stability, the legitimacy of their rule, the repression or coercion of dissent, and the co-optation of their potential rival, rivals. In the light of declining co-optation capacity over time due to gradually reducing oil revenues, not to mention major fluctuations such as those related to the oil price drop in 2014-2015 and the COVID-related recession to come, the 2020 Karabakh War can be seen as a bid to strengthen the pillar of legitimacy and by implication moderate the need for coercion. Azerbaijan's reinforced alliance with Turkey represents the embrace and indeed the capture of the Turkic revival that informed Azerbaijan's early post-Soviet national identity politics, with the nationalist opposition now being blamed for the defeats that Ilham Aliyev has now reversed. From what we can see, uh, this is a pivot that is working so far. Azerbaijani society appears to be solidly consolidated uh, and unified. What remains to be seen, however, is whether symbolic relegitimation combined with state economic control under conditions of reducing resource rents and the huge economic strain of reconstructing and rehabilitating deoccupied areas will lessen the need for coercion long-term. If it does not, however, another implication of the Karabakh war is a dramatic rise in Azerbaijan's coercive capacity should the balancing of the three pillars of stability require this. As Levitsky and Wei's work on competitive authoritarian regimes argued for the Armenian case, the presence of high state coercive capacity inherited from victory in the first Karabakh war played a critical role in the violent suppression of protest in 1996, in 2004, and crucially uh, in 2008. Thus in Azerbaijan, 2020 has seen a powerful reinvigoration of neo-patrimonial rule, of prerogative power, and a particularly hegemonic variant of authoritarianism. So what about the non-authoritarian or at least hybrid alternative in the South Caucasus? Hybrid regimes uh, continued to present analytically challenging phenomena defying easy categorization. This comes in the context uh, of a well-documented long-term uh, global decline uh, in democracy. Uh, for Freedom House, 2020 marked a new and specific milestone as the countries experiencing deterioration outnumbered those with improvements by the largest margin recorded since the negative trend began in, 20, in, in 2006. So what do we see in the South Caucasus? A year after street protest was violently dispersed in summer 2019, Georgia's parliamentary election on the 31st of October 2020 resulted in sustained deadlock between incumbent Georgian dream and the opposition national movement, 
stretched on far into the present year, eventually leading to the resignation of Prime Minister Georgi Gakharia and becoming the, the object of high level EU mediation. In Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan's persistent clashes with the judiciary, repeated mobilization of crowds in support of policy initiatives, and perceived personalization of the process against the Robert Korcharyan generated wariness over populistic tendencies and inabilities to institutionalize democratic practices, even when confronting authoritarian reserves. In January 2020, Abkhazia saw the resignation of Raul Hajimba and the annulment of his presidential election win by the territory Supreme Court after protests had stormed the presidential building. And then we saw the subsequent election of Aslam Jania. While in these contexts, the constitutional state periodically succeeded in imposing itself on prerogative power, it remains deeply constrained. Whether through the continued influence of informal networked power or the leveraging of populist legitimacy, the circumvention of institutions and formal mechanisms continues to be a key aspect of the contestation of power. These outcomes present a dichotomy uh, between the apparent continuing demand for transformation and the apparent elusiveness of regularized, institutionally contained change. Across the South Caucasus, reconciliation is today evoked as often for, for domestic politics as for the region's ethno-territorial conflicts. So for social scientists, these outcomes present new iterations of long-standing phenomena that can be situated in a, in a fantastically rich literature that by various names and frameworks addresses hybridity from competitive authoritarianism to being partly free, from anocracies to dominant power systems, from linkage and leverage to distinct and rival domains of state space. Situating and accounting for these outcomes remains both practically and analytically urgent. Now, this is a huge subject, and I just want to highlight two aspects um, that uh, seem particularly important in the light of 2020. The first of these is the tension between the often extreme polarization of political elites and the apparent growth of apathy or the entity sometimes referred to as the silent majority. As political elites engage in an often highly, highly personalized aesthetics of confrontation, non-partisanship is growing. At an event that we held in Chatham House in April, uh, Koba Turmanidze cited figures of 60% for respondents in polls in Georgia not identifying with any political party or force. Pre-election polls in Armenia conducted by the International Republican Institute in April indicated that 65% of respondents either didn't know who they would vote for, would vote for none or refused to answer. So there is a cluster of questions around how we can understand the don't knows and won't answers of the South Caucasus. How should we understand the political agency of those who by withdrawing their participation can generate sufficient uncertainty to make outcomes unpredictable, yet who can under certain conditions exercise agency to make outcomes decisive as appear to happen just now in the Armenian election. The second aspect is the consistent potential for anomaly. The South Caucasus continues to present us with what might seem like anomalous outcomes. Democratization within a Russian geopolitical orbit, variation among de facto entities that many would have us believe are marionettes of the same outside power, decisive electoral victory in the aftermath of decisive military defeat. Rather than convergence, we see continued interactions of rival principles of power and a perennially constrained struggle of push and pull forces with neither integrative nor geopolitical ve vectors being decisive. So let's move to the uh, geopolitical dimension. As the New York Times headline with, with which I began suggests, every assumption about the preeminence of the geopolitical in the South Caucasus appears to be confirmed in 2020. This narrative resonates with, with what we can, what we can uh, identify as the primary outcome of the Second Karabakh War, the regionalization of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, meaning that it is no longer a conflict in which a multilateral coalition of states seeks to mediate and resolve uh, a conflict, but has become the object of a Russian-Turkish condominium directed at managing conflict through a regionalized negotiation among relevant powers. Russia dominates the security field and remains the guardian of the 9th of November 2020 ceasefire declaration. Its security agencies will uh, control existing and prospective transit corridors across uh, Azerbaijani and Armenian territory. 
And through the deployment of a contingency of 2,000 peacekeepers and as many support staff, Russia now has a military presence in the internationally recognized territory of all three uh, South Caucasian states. Turkey plays a secondary role in these new, sec new security arrangements with a nominal presence at a ceasefire monitoring center near Agdam. Its principal security gains, however, were already achieved prior to the ceasefire in the internationally keenly observed spectacle of an almost exclusively Russian armed and equipped army being destroyed by one largely, if far from exclusively, trained and equipped by Turkey. Turkey potentially also stands to benefit across a broader bandwidth uh, than just security if projected transit corridors open. Turkish firms will play a, a central role in the rehabilitation of deoccupied areas. A second key outcome, indeed the flip side of regionalization, is the marginalization of the multilateral international platforms for conflict resolution. There is an extensive critique of the Minsk Group and the OSCE already out there, highlighting the ineffectiveness of exclusive, top-down and elite-centered mediation practices. While the Minsk Group continues to call on Armenia and Azerbaijan to resume talks, and no one seems to want to disband it completely, the reality is that neither Russia nor Azerbaijan uh, appear to be motivated to embed the outcomes of the war either within a resumed multilateral mandate at, o at the OSCE or a new, new one at the United Nations Security Council. What we are seeing instead is the emergence of an apparent consensus among Azerbaijan, Russia, Turkey and Iran on the validity of a regionalized framework expressed in the crisp language of three plus three, signifying the three Caucasus states uh, and the, th and the th South Caucasus states and the three regional powers uh, as the alternative to, a to multilateral politics. As such, we are seeing local impacts of long-standing global shifts towards a multipolar pat patterning of power leveraged into the South Caucasus by external hegemons through elite level connections and linkages in the region, rather than through an intra-regional consensus, a pattern highly characteristic of fractured regions. An important implication given the identities and orientations of the three regional powers is what you might call the post-Westernization of the South Caucasus. The challenges, this challenges an assumption that appeared to be unassailable in the 1990s, which was the European destiny of the South Caucasus. A third important outcome is the transformation of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict into a test case of the illiberal peace. A significant metric of multilateral decline has been the decline of conflicts ending in peacefully negotiated settlements over the last decade and the emergence, as Claudia highlighted in her presentation, of authoritarian conflict management, uh, or what scholars also call the illiberal peace as an alternative to democratic, inclusive and participatory approaches to conflict resolution. Rather than resolving conflict, the illiberal peace seeks to suppress it by homogenizing political communities, controlling discursive and political, uh, sorry, discursive and physical space, securitizing non-state actors and framing conflict as internal uh, sorry, as external interference, warranting Titan's political and security controls. Overhanging the project of a regionalized illiberal peace is the question of how communities saturated with enemy images of each other will transact with, let alone trust one another. The 9th of November, 2020 ceasefire statement is more than a ceasefire in that it stipulates the opening of all borders and transportation routes. If enacted, this would certainly entail a radical transformation of the region with economic benefits for all. A core question then revolves around the compatibility of a borderless, economically enabled South Caucasus with the political effects of illiberal peacemaking. A fourth outcome is the appearance within the South Caucasus of differing approaches to managing conflict. While illiberal regional powers have become the managers of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, the OSCE, EU, and UN continue to co-chair the Geneva international discussions encompassing the conflicts invo involving Georgia. The GID is a forum that falls short of a peace process mandated to resolve core issues and is directed more at managing and containing conflict. The South Caucasus therefore now features alternative, if you will, multipolar and multilateral, liberal multilateral conflict management forums, each drawing on quite distinct kinds of international agency uh, and linkage. So what we now see in the South Caucasus is a new iteration of competition 
uh, between differing projects in hegemonic regionalism. On the one hand, we have a great power concert that has effectively poached the Karabakh conflict out of a liberal multilateral framework and seeks to re-embed it within a new post-Western regional dispensation, the three plus three formula, which might also be called the Caucasian concert after the 19th century concert of Europe, or what has been referred to uh, by Azerbaijani policymakers as a Pax Caucasia. On the other hand, we have the Eastern Partnership, a weakened multilateral program still premised on convergence with Europe. What I want to draw attention to, however, is not so much the competitive dynamic between these projects, which preserves a thin conception of South Caucasian geopolitics as the pawn of great powers. Instead, what I think is more important is the resistance to either project posed by regional fracture. This suggests that while the parameters will differ, Pax Caucasia and the efforts to embed the South Caucasus within a regional region building framework led by neighboring powers will encounter similar problems to the Eastern partnership before it. The regional fracture paradigm offers insights into these dynamics by emphasizing the fragmented and ad hoc application of power and influence by outside actors in the absence of a region-wide governance framework. Regional fracture theory identifies the islands of power syndrome, which sees external hegemons unable to exercise power and influence uniformly due to the absence of a region-wide governance uh, institutional framework. Instead, external hegemons exercise power inconsistently and see their linkages further diluted through the weak institutions of regional states and disembedded nature of political elites, meaning their isolation from dense and durable social ties and mechanisms. This is a different perspective from that of great power overlay. Rather, the dynamic that I would like to emphasize is how regional fracture both enables and obstructs the leveraging and penetration of external influence. Hegemonic power is itself compartmentalized and contained as region building continues to be isolated from durable social ties, social capital, and intra-regional consensus. Instead, we see the dominance of top-down, transient elite connections that are vulnerable to geopolitical and domestic shifts, and the instability of power relations pulling parts of the region up and out of the South Caucasus towards specific patrons and hegemons who are themselves engaged in competitive, cooperative relations subject to unpredictable shifts. In other words, regional fracture looks set to continue in an uneven push-pull dynamic among external actors and political elites. So let's move to the social dimension. The idea of being a region or of regionhood points to the socially constructed nature of regions. In the South Caucasus, fractures in the principles and exercise of domestic power and a fractured regional setting characterized by rival projects in hegemonic regionalism converge with a disparate set of fractures in the domain of identities, values, and ideas. Like the rest of the world, the South Caucasus has its local iterations of what Alexander Cooley and David Nexon in their book, Exit from Hegemony, analyze as right-wing transnationalism and counter-order movements. As elsewhere, these focus on emotive social issues such as public health policy, sexual and gender diversity, religion, race, and so on. Mobilization around these issues utilizes, uh, as elsewhere, communications and disinformation strategies aimed at magnifying local cleavages on these issues. Last year saw particular opportunities for these familiar modus operandi. The pandemic both exposed social inequalities and meshed with post-truth debates over the authority of science and scientific knowledge. Vaccine skepticism has been reported, uh, as I've seen in recent months, to be higher than 50% among opinion poll respondents in Georgia and Armenia. Another aspect is the continuing visibility of nativist or outright movements uh, through organizations and activists such as Adeklad in Armenia, Kartuli Marshi, and Levan Vasadze in Georgia. The rise of this uncivil society presents its own particular Eurasian emphases with focal points on Western-funded NGOs, Sorosizatsia, Western discourses of LGBT rights, and the democracy security dichotomies reinvigorated by the war in nagorno karabakh By magnifying social fracturing on hot identity topics, these trends disrupt the cohering of shared values and norms as markers of regional social capital. 
However, while they may have been boosted by events in 2020, they are far from unique either uh, to 2020 or to the South Caucasus. Um, and I'd like to round off my talk by focusing on a different aspect uh, of social fracturing that is more specific to the South Caucasus in 2020. And this is in the realm of affect and emotionality. Now, emotions have been traditionally contrasted with rationality uh, in social science and have remained in the distant periphery uh, of, of much of, uh, of political science uh, and inter international relations in particular. Emotions defy metrics, predictability, or isolation as variables. Quantifying them is extremely challenging. Yet their salience as social and political forces has been on vivid, visceral display in the South Caucasus over the last year. Now, scholars working within uh, an international relations framework increasingly recognize emotions, not as personal and individuated, but as deeply cultural and social phenomena. As Emma Hutchison writes, one's emotionality is, is dependent upon a culturally grounded set of meanings to both inspire feelings and to in turn provide a basis for their interpretation. To experience pride, pain, humiliation, or vengefulness, one must be grounded in a cultural context that makes pride, pain, humiliation, or vengefulness meaningful, and in turn de determines a response to that emotion as something positive or negative. Scholars, including and especially from a feminist perspective, have highlighted how political identities are brought into being by embodied and emotional processes. And some pioneers of these approaches, such as Elizabeth Millitz and Carolyn Schur, have brought these to the study of affective nationalism uh, in the South Caucasus, and a uh, case study uh, in Azerbaijan. These perspectives seem specifically relevant to the current moment due to the particular weight of collective emotions after trauma. As Hutchison writes, while the experience of trauma is itself isolating and silencing of the individual, the impulse to bear witness makes the, the aftermath of trauma intrinsically social and ultimately constitutive of political communities, or what Hutchison calls affective communities. The post-traumatic moment is one of considerable flux and liminality, which makes it unsurprising that political elites often rush in to reassert their narratives of control after catastrophe and to channel the communally constitutive effects of trauma towards reinforcing existing patterns of political authority. Thus, I would suggest uh, that the importance of research into the affective communities of the South Caucasus has been underlined by the events of 2020. A new cycle of memorialization and ritualized commemoration is beginning, and it is important to reflect on whether these will embed new potentials for humiliation, retribution to dominate, or allow processes of grief and mourning to pass and enable new meanings uh, in inter-ethnic relations to be created. As a practitioner, I attach particular importance to the latter because while appeals to a transactional rationality uh, have their place in confidence building, and Andrea re referred earlier to uh, many of the stereotypes that are, are currently circulating on regional connectivity, such efforts will inevitably encounter a reckoning with the emotional cultures within which they are implemented. Uh, so with that, I'd like to close. Thank you very much uh, for listening. I've been talking for a long time um, and I welcome your comments uh, and, and questions. Thank you. Dear Lawrence, thanks, thank you and thanks so much for, uh, for, such, a very, for such insightful uh, uh, insightful talk. I think it is really important that uh, scholars of the South Caucasus understand uh, the the complexity of uh, of the region, uh, and uh, uh, it is it is very important that we not only look at the, let's say at geopolitical or like state versus state levels, which in fact is elites versus elite elites, right? Uh, but as well as uh, individual, um, the community level of uh, how uh, with regard to uh, relations between. Uh, groups and uh, how they reflect uh, uh, upon the changes that uh, ensue on, on, on their communities. Uh, what, so I just wanted to kind of highlight two things that uh, kind of I was, uh, when I was kind of listening to your speech, I actually I was reflecting back to my um, 
uh, previous let's say, experiences. So first is whether the South Caucasus can be considered as region. As a geographer, I tend to think that it is one. But I had this very interesting experience with my colleague in back in uh, 2015, I think, in Yerevan, when uh, we were talking about um, kind of some about commonalities and. Uh, that colleague actually highlighted that she would not even consider South Caucasus as one region, as all the three countries have like have chosen, let's say so, like different paths to follow after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, but considering the um, the experience that all these countries had of like of uh, being under, let's say, under common political structures or even even formally being united under the uh, kind of uh, common entity, like the, even during the Soviet era or the short-lived uh, before, like before the after, right after the uh, disintegration of Russian Empire and before the emergence of the three separate nation states, uh, still, still uh, hint us that these countries and these three societies. Uh, I'm not right now talking about, let's say, uh, the, uh, the the countries that are, let's say, uh, in a liminal state of recognition, non-recognition. So they have basically an experience of uh, working together and um, kind of resolving common problems. Um, so uh, I, first of all, I mean, I want, I really wanted to open up our discussion and questions from the audience and I will be very happy to uh, um, introduce our audience members. Uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and uh, pose your question to, 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 um, to Lawrence. Uh, yes, I, I, I see. Yes, Jout Bay, please go ahead. And uh, then I will read out uh, Lana and Julia's uh, question too. Uh, first, first of all, I really thank you all for this inviting me, and also Dr. Burrs for this insightful, uh, like assessment of the Cau Caucasus. And also, it is first time that I met with Dr. Burrs. I uh, like it is virtual. I hope in the future it will be also in reality as well. Uh, I have uh, two half question, half comment, kind of. Uh, so one is about the uh, consolidation of Russia in the South Caucasus and uh, Turkey as a one of the dominant uh, geopolitical great power actor. Uh, we, in this assessment, we say that uh, e the EU left outside of the political development of the uh, post-conflict and also Azerbaijan have chosen different uh, direction to for it is political authoritarian modernization, we can say. So uh, as I, uh, from economic and social and also political engagement with EU, all these uh, three countries have uh, interdependence with EU, well, it different levels, yes, but still, the, uh, for instance, even if we look at trade and political engagement of Azerbaijan and Armenia, they have a still significant interdependence between the EU and uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. So uh, my question is, are these countries have chosen different paths or the EU not engaged enough with this region, particularly uh, when we assess Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan individually engagement with the EU, uh, it seems that EU also not very much engaged. For instance, like uh, uh, conflicts in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, EU also restrained to engage uh, to this country, try to make like a protect balance, but uh, also not engage it. And uh, second, uh, about the uh, uh, about the 
social uh, for, uh, basis of the uh, it is you if I am not uh, if I am not wrong as you said social elites have chosen different paths uh, so particularly in the case of Azerbaijan and democracy is like a, a, how to say decline it even not uh, develop it enough but in when we consider social social level in Azerbaijan also people more pro western than any other uh, road they are uh, thinking particularly maybe it is a silent majority uh, but still like a majority of the people see the country as a democratic as a pro progressive and uh, Azerbaijani like uh, elites view also is not well, different interpretation of the modernity and democracy. For instance, uh, in, in interview with uh, BBC, Ali have said that, well, we are not like a sample of the democratic country, but we are, we aim to develop on this road. And Azerbaijan's not engagement with Russia, well, uh, still Azerbaijan launched like a, a this attack or let's say second Karabakh war and the occupation of the Shusha still was against Russian will. So Azerbaijan also uh, like, well, accepted Russian peace uh, fire troops there, but still Azerbaijan is a uh, mainly against Russia's will and uh, uh, follow policies, particularly uh, railroads, energy routes, all when, when we consider all these policies, Azerbaijan still challenges and Russian will in this region or dominance, hegemonies in this region. I would uh, uh, be happy to uh, hear your comments about this two questions. Thank you, John Bay. Thank you. Should I answer? Yes, absolutely. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question of the Europeanization or not uh, of, of the South Caucasus. And I mean, we see, I think, two patterns. One is, as you pointed out, Jabad Bay, a kind of a, a lack of engagement and, and mechanisms through which to engage the South Caucasus coming from the EU. Uh, let's remember that um, at the moment in the 1990s, uh, perhaps when uh, identification with the West was at its highest, uh, the EU was not ready, uh, didn't have the mechanisms or the frameworks. And it wasn't until uh, 2009, in fact, that we see the Eastern Partnership uh, emerging. Um, um, as a, a framework uh, for engagement. Um, so that's on the one side. On the other side, very differing demands. Um, you know, we have a, a very bespoke ad hoc series of engagements from an association agreement with Georgia, the uh, enhanced uh, cooperation uh, agreement uh, in Armenia, and still ongoing negotiations for a strategic partnership uh, with, with Azerbaijan. Um, so uh, I, I think these two uh, factors uh, are key in explaining, you know, the weakness uh, of the West, plus I think uh, overwrought expectations. Um, I think we've all been, well, I had certainly have, uh, kind of perhaps working within a framework that simply assumed uh, the, uh, the inevitability uh, of, of, of integration. And I think the other issue here is the uh, EU as a normative power. Um, and how that has conflicted or come into attention uh, with uh, the regime dynamics uh, across the South Caucasus. So I think, you know, lots of reasons why um, EU engagement has been, uh, uh, I think, you know, perhaps less than, than many people expected. I don't think there's anything surprising about the EU being sidelined uh, by the Second Karabakh War. Uh, the EU doesn't pretend to exercise geopolitical or hard power. Um, and that was very much, I think, uh, a, a context in which hard power uh, was uh, applied. Um, in terms of you know, what has emerged as the alternative to uh, regional integration and integration with the EU, uh, is the, the continued salience of bilateralism 
uh, and special relationships. Um, so uh, Georgia's relationship with the US, uh, particularly under the national movement government, uh, Armenia's relationship with Russia and Azerbaijan's relationship with Turkey uh, have offered in a sense an alternative uh, modus operandi. And I think that's, as I was saying, uh, very much reinvigorated uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the Second Karabakh War. So um, as I wrote in a piece for Eurasianet, I think the EU is now you know, looking uh, for a role looking for ways uh, to, uh, to re-establish a, a sense of trust uh, in, in the region and to perhaps quietly re-multilateralize some issues and domains, but only when there's a local demand uh, for that to happen. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another, we have a question from Lana Gwinjili. I'll just read it out. Do you agree with the assumption that COVID-19 and pandemic restrictions coming from the inevitable objectives of people's health and safety damaged overall situation with democracy and majority of semi-democratic regimes? And I think that also refers to the South Caucasus. What would be your opinion on that? Well, I would preface any comments that I might make uh, by saying this is not something that I have specifically uh, researched, and I'm sure there are perhaps others in this audience uh, who would be better placed to answer. Um, but it, it seems to me that it's too early to say. Um, we need to look longer term um, at the regime trajectories and, and all the different uh, attributes and markers uh, of, of regime type and to, to kind of look in the long term retrospectively whether there was a, a significant additional decline related to the COVID-19 period uh, that we can discern uh, in the long term trajectories uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the region states. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, Tim Blauvelt spoke about uh, issues around public trust uh, in his comments yesterday. Um, yeah, I, I think we need to, to, to see longer term uh, how those uh, events have, have kind of affected trajectories. Um, and I suppose a, a key question would be, are the longer term trajectories going to be any different for COVID-19, given the broader uh, global context that I alluded to around, you know, protracted uh, democratic backsliding? Um, so, yeah, sorry, that's not a very conclusive answer. Thanks so much. Uh, Hans Kutbrot also wrote about the uh, question about fracture and moral discourse. Dr. Blog, Dr. Gutbrot, perhaps you would uh, uh, unmute and uh, just uh, uh, pose your question to, uh, to Yes, Lawrence, audience. thank you for the very interesting talk. And I think uh, it, is, it is great to see how things are meshed both with a kind of low, kind of comprehensive analysis of what happens on the ground and also a theoretical framework but this is where I just wanted to get some of your thoughts and that uh, uh, tying into something that, that I had said a couple of weeks ago, that I wonder to what extent a degree of the fracture is due to uh, an inability, if you will, of Western scholars and Western academia to provide a kind of a coherent and comprehensive framework. And what we've seen, for example, in the moral debate uh, around the 44 day war, there were kind of the discussions were totally missing each other. Yeah, I mean, in terms of people insisting on, you know, this particular aspect, whereas others insisting on that aspect. And I do think that a critique that some people have made of the state of moral discourse in, in a Western context, and with this, I don't mean to plug kind of conservative approaches, a conservative rest uh, restitution of that. But that is, I think, something we can observe in this particular context. And I think it has tremendous damage because we see that people essentially are fumbling around in, in a kind of incoherent uh, uh, way, not because of mistakes of their own, but in part because a kind of context has gotten lost. And so, so to speak, the, the, the moral debate in, a, in the Western context has gotten so fractured that there's almost no alternative but fracture in the local context as well. Anyway, these, I, I know these, these ideas are a bit out there, but, uh, but I'd, I'd be curious whether maybe that inspires some thoughts. Uh, thank you, uh, Hans. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I, I think your question raises, you know, this enduring geopolitical ambiguity. Where, where does this region belong? Does it even exist as a region? Uh, what is its moral universe? Uh, is there the potential for a singular uh, moral universe? And to which other universes does it attach and belong? And it, it kind of you know, taps into this uh, perennial question uh, which David uh, referred to, is this a region in what domains uh, and, and discursive spaces does it constitute a region? It's an inherited imperial cartography. Uh, it's a region for policymakers. It's a region of convenience, but it doesn't seem to constitute uh, a kind of a moral space of its own. So yes, I, 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 I take your point. Um, that uh, in, in a fractured kind of global uh, and regional environment, um, uh, we can see uh, that this region doesn't belong anywhere neatly. Uh, we see that in terms of the uh, ambiguities of the higher denominator spaces in which it's supposed to belong. Eastern Europe, Eurasia, what is Eurasia? Uh, and now we've seen various form of, forms of linkages reactivated with the Middle East. Uh, so it is this kind of existential ambiguity of a multi-facing uh, periphery uh, that uh, feeds into um, the, the fracture. So I guess one question would be, uh, I mean, that, that kind of uh, uh, fracture around uh, moral discourses, I think, has also been uh, a strategy by entrepreneurs of fracture in the region itself who have invited us uh, to uh, see civilizational uh, uh, differences uh, as being at, at the core of some of the, the region's conflicts. Um, and there have been audiences from outside who, who have been very keen and have rushed, rushed to see such civilizational uh, uh, affinities. Um, and so it, it's once again, this pattern of, of particular actors in the region being lifted out of the region and attaching to uh, outside uh, poles of attraction um, and, and thereby, you know, consolidating uh, and accentuate, accentuating uh, fracture. So yeah, that's not very coherent, but, uh, but yes, I think there is a multi-layeredness to the fracture. Uh, and I think what, what you suggest actually adds a whole new dimension to it, which is around the fracture of moral discourses, and you know, perhaps more work on affective communities uh, could begin uh, to craft uh, a more locally owned and integrated moral universe, at least, uh, on which uh, other kinds uh, of, of integration could could be could be built. Great, thank you. I, I like the term the the kind of entrepreneur is a fracture. That's a yeah, very good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, we have two questions from uh, Dr. Uh, Manasyan and then uh, from Dona Shahnazarian, and I guess we can uh, wrap up uh, our uh, discussion. Uh, first question from uh, her, uh, from Dr. Manasyan would be, what do you think on perspective of the suggested platform of six? Uh, and the second question would be, would you agree that during the crisis, the autocratic regimes are more effective than hybrid or democratic ones? On this platform of six, I mean, I think the first thing to say about this is that once again, this is an idea that's come from outside of the region. It was suggested, it proposed in, in Turkey uh, and taken up uh, by, by Azerbaijan in particular. Um, and yeah, we think about that platform of six, there are clearly uh, two dissidents uh, in that cohort of six. Uh, so I think you know, we, we immediately see uh, an issue with, with how uh, the perspectives of Georgia and Armenia uh, would fit into uh, this, this externally uh, generated uh, concept. Um, and, and beyond that, I mean, I think this, the platform of six is associated with uh, a lot of the discourses that a a and Andrea referred to, uh, kind of glossy uh, projections of, of regional connectivity, transit corridors, um, uh, and economic uh, integration, um, 
this is a very top-down uh, structural uh, kind of approach to region building. Uh, what we don't see uh, and what we don't hear enough about uh, are community perspectives um, on how all of this is going to work. So I think you know the platform of six represents a kind of externally generated uh, a, a, a non-inclusive uh, vision uh, for the Caucasus. Um, but I think we need to, you know, that, that needs to be linked to an, an awful lot of work at the grassroots level um, uh, with different communities to, to get their buy-in uh, into how that's actually going to work uh, in practice. Um, in terms of the relative merits of autocracy and, and democracy, again, I'm not sure that I can really answer that question. It's not something that I have uh, studied uh, or researched uh, myself. There may be others in this audience who could answer it uh, better. Um, I mean, just very superficially, uh, it does seem that um, proportionally speaking, it is the, the hybrid alternatives that have, have suffered uh, higher instances uh, of infection. Um, but uh, I, I think what's also going to be crucial is the capacity of these different regime types to learn lessons and embed uh, legacies uh, of the pandemic. Um, and I would wager that, that potentially it is the, the hybrid regimes in, in the region that may be better placed uh, to, to, to do that. So again, it, it feels as if it's, it's too early to say. Thanks so much. Dr. Shah Nazarian, please go ahead with the question. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very much. This was very interesting lecture, presentation, keynote. And uh, my, my question is kind of general. And I was uh, wondering if, uh, if you, in your mind, construct you this conflict, I mean, Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, uh, as a separate from Armenian-Turkish conflict. Uh, you, uh, uh, and uh, as everybody knows that this is very ambiguous question, because we know that they say, Bir millet iki devlet, uh, and uh, we are together, and we have national idea together, or pan-Turkism or whatever, but at the same time, um, but at the same time, it looks like, um, you know, the, the, the very Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is kind of fostered by Ottoman Empire. Uh, it, it, this is how uh, Armenian side sees this conflict. Well, what is your vision, please? Thank you. I love the fact that you always give the easy questions, uh, Nona. Um, I mean, clearly there are uh, different histories and different clusters uh, of issues that are assumed by the entities that we call the Armenian-Turkish and uh, Armenian-Azerbaijani conflicts. Um, but what we've seen clearly over the last uh, 18 months is uh, their accelerated interpenetration. Uh, and, and mutual reinforcement. Um, so uh, I think disentangling them is extremely challenging. Um, and clearly there need to be uh, multi-layered efforts uh, if we're talking about uh, conflict resolution and, and peace building, uh, there needs to be uh, kind of interlinked but separate uh, conversations uh, to, to resolve the different issues. Um, as we saw with the football diplomacy uh, initiative, uh, one of these conflicts is sufficiently embedded in the other uh, for progress on one to be impossible uh, without progress uh, in, in the other. Uh, so a very complicated set uh, of interrelated uh, issues, um, discourses and actors. It's uh, not dissimilar um, or can be compared, I would, I would argue, uh, with the interpenetration of Georgian Abhaz and Georgian Russian uh, layers uh, of contestation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that uh, to talk about a, a Georgian Abhaz conflict is, is not acceptable for some, uh, but clearly there are distinct uh, baskets of issues and distinct levels of agency uh, which need to be engaged with uh, for, for comprehensive uh, processes to, to mitigate these conflicts. So not a very satisfactory answer perhaps, but uh, yeah, disentangling these two uh, conflicts is very, very challenging. 
Thank you, Bor. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Nona. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, dear Jaud, by I guess if you could frame your question in a uh, uh, kind of very well, uh, uh, clear, I don't have a question. Great. Ah, okay. Uh, I I don't only have like a comment with uh, Ms. Minasian, Dr. Minasian, uh, second question that hybrid democratic ones and authoritarian ones. Actually, we had a workshop on it uh, a few weeks ago therefore, about COVID. And therefore, I can only say that, I can only comment that uh, this, uh, since authoritarian uh, regimes and uh, states are uh, data in these countries are not available to open and free for everyone. Therefore, it is very uh, hard to get exact data, how much they successful, how much they uh, uh, manage it uh, successfully the crisis. Therefore, mostly there is this kind of like trade of uh, compare them with democratic states. Uh, mostly, yes, hybrid, hybrid states fail to uh, manage crisis due to their structure. They couldn't uh, make a consolidated structure, either democratic or authoritarian. But uh, mostly uh, authoritarian states are not free. Data is not reliable to make a right assessment with uh, democratic states. but. Mostly uh, as a recent example, China, US democratic failure in Trump era and China was successful uh, handling crisis. But after Biden era, it seems that no democratic, if the institutional level, everything works right, democratic states are more, much more capable to handle, for instance, vaccination and handling social uh, support to citizen. So, uh, and German example and South Korea example. So we shouldn't just focus pick some states. There are some democratic states that successfully handle it, crisis. So I just wanted to comment that uh, this dichotomy between. Thanks so much. Dear Herine, would you like to add something? Uh -huh. Uh, just just to clarify, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Jamad Bey, uh, for answering the question, picking up it. But uh, when talking about uh, my question, perhaps was not clear enough. Saying crisis, I didn't mean the COVID-19, but also the war. So the Turkey and Azerbaijan are autocratic regimes and Russia even became autocratic. Uh, Russia slowed down. Uh, when I uh, compare the trends, uh, slowed down from uh, being semi uh, to the autocratic. And it is likely that uh, they, uh, they were successful uh, compared to, to the actions or ability to mobilize the resource, uh, fight, etc. during the war. So that was much larger than simply COVID-19. And uh, uh, apologies for <laughs> not stating clearly what I do mean. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I think, uh, yeah, I would, I would thank you uh, for all participants and especially uh, Dr. Broers for very insightful uh, talk, uh, first of all. And secondly, for their contribution to uh, to 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 this uh, panel, to, to, to this discussion, uh, I think it was very enriching and uh, very thought provoking. That, that I would say, and the idea of uh, regional fracture is something that I think we need to um, think about when uh, when um, analyzing the not only geopolitics but perhaps even internal politics of these three countries i mean uh, unfortunately what we can see that is that the, the, um, we still think about uh, uh, these countries and the region in general from the kind of from the outside pers outsiders perspective even uh, local scholars fall into the trap uh, and i think i think that uh, the suggested uh, framework actually uh, some uh, really manages to kind of break 
uh, break up this uh, dominant narrative and uh, also introduce local voices, not only elites voices, but local voices into, 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 into the discussion. And uh, Dr. Boris, thanks so much for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, for bringing up this idea, and I think it's worth it. Definitely, is worth uh, further worth of further discussions. Uh, on that note, I, I I wanted to kind of say a few words. Um, uh, our uh, seventh annual conference uh, reached to its end, so it's been a very very busy two days uh, in extraordinary times. So we titled our conference as Taking Stock of Change, South Caucasus after a turbulent year. So indeed 2020 had brought immense challenges and challenges to the countries of the South Caucasus, being it uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the war or the political turmoils in each of the constituent countries of the region. And it, of course, it refers to the uh, the three countries that kind of are recognized uh, internationally, as well as territories that have limited or no international recognition. But these are populated by people. So therefore, it is very important that we also uh, kind of think about these issues. Uh, we had 16 panel presentations during these three days. And we had three, uh, uh, three keynote speakers who uh, talked about the both methodological um, issues uh, that uh, researchers face, as well as they had more substantive contributions to uh, to our conference. And I think that's the uh, that's the uh, strength of CRC's uh, conferences. That uh, uh, in apart from kind of contributions more in from the kind of area studies perspective. Uh, uh, it also brings quite strong and lessened uh, methodological uh, discussions to the table, uh, which unfortunately uh, many of the academic discussions in this region lack. And, um, uh, and I think that's the strength of this conference that it kind of manages to, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, combine uh, both, both, both uh, the best of the both worlds, so to say. Uh, and at the end, I, I just wanted to say a, a few words. Words. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much to uh, our participants uh, uh, for taking time and uh, joining in from unusual time zones. Uh, I think I, I guess that was quite challenging, but we want to thank you all for that. I want to thank to our keynote speakers, Dr. Lawrence Brewers, Professor uh, Jennifer McCoy, uh, Dr. Georg Erikian for their insightful and uh, uh, very interesting contributions to our conference. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the teams of all three CRCs who worked hard to make this conference happen. I, uh, and especially thank you uh, goes to Mariam Kopaladze, who's been uh, behind all the organizational uh, uh, organizational um, practicalities, uh, and I think uh, the the reason why this conference went so smoothly and successfully is because Mariam worked really hard. And thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, we would like to uh, say thank you as well as to. Uh, um, to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which had been a strong supporter for CRC offices uh, uh, for uh, over these years. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, finally, it's sort of kind of a sad note, but uh, still it's um, uh, also kind of a in between. Uh, we would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Helena Minasian of uh, CRC Armenia. Uh, um, big thank you for her continuing work. If, if you are not aware, Dr. Minasian uh, uh, will be uh, the Director Emerita of uh, CRC Armenia and uh, will be supporting CRC Armenia's uh, activities, but still, she will be um, kind of, uh, she, she will be moving at uh, at a different capacity. And of course, this is very sad, but it is great that we will also 
uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Thank Marcia. you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> Don't make me <laughs> Oh No, no, no. Yeah, it's. I think it is really important to point out because uh, she did uh, uh, a tremendous amount of work to advance uh, the work of uh, the all three offices and the idea of CRC. And as they say, <laughs> once a CRC, so don't worry. Yes. <laughs> once a CRC, always CRC. So uh, thanks so much again for, for your work and dedication to, to our offices. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, um, due to, uh, due to, uh, Due to pandemic and uh, various other reasons, we unfortunately had to hold last two conferences online, but uh, we very much look forward uh, to uh, host you in Tbilisi in 2022. Well, I said that <laughs> last year too, but I really hope that it will be the case. So looking forward to that as well as, uh, so we will be also working on the new Cox barometer survey. Uh, and hopefully we will also be able to present some of the results in 2022. Um, again, let me uh, uh, say thank you again to all of you and uh, wish you a very productive and peaceful uh, uh, months before uh, our conference. And see you, see you in Tbilisi in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you for so the great much. event. Well said, Dato. <laughs> Thanks, Hans. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks again, Jen, for being here, again, Jen. It's been fun working with you over the years. <laughs> okay. Have a nice evening. <laughs> you Thanks too. so much, Stephanie. And good well, luck. Bye.